Okay, so um, welcome to a gentle introduction to recommendation as counterfactual policy learning. I'm going to take you through uh, part one with uh, Olivia. There's lots of authors and lots of contributors to this uh, presentation. You've only got four of us here today, so um, I'm David, but it's also later on Flavian will be taking through part two with Amin. And in part one, it's uh, myself and Olivia. But there's other people that have contributed a lot to this work. Um, you can see the slides, I assume. Um, yes, uh, can, Olivia, can you confirm that it, you, the sharing okay? Looks like it is. Yeah, 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 yeah it, uh, it's okay. It's okay, fine. so as I mentioned, these links, this one will take you to our, our repo. So here you'll see all the notebooks with, with all the solutions here. So um, that might be easier if you're coming back after it rather than doing the exercises yourself if you want to see full work solutions. Uh, we also have a few that are taking you to Collaboratory. And the nice thing about this is there's no config. All you need is a Google account, and it will just run. So um, I can click on this one now. And I probably will need to share screen again if you want to see this. Um, we do a new share. And can you see it now? The Collaboratory? No. Yeah, but I think we need to uh, maybe uh, zoom out. Quite a bit. Okay. So yeah, it yeah. looks okay. Um, so anyway, so it might be just worth you doing this step, and then you can go run all, run anyway. The first step here is we'll do an install of RecordGym, which is an environment. We'll tell you our environment for simulated recommendation. We'll tell you all about what it is and why we built it in this course. And you'll see this is obviously a very simple example, but it really steps you through how RecordGym works. Um, and if you get this far, it should work because it's, uh, the config is pretty much done for you by Google. So just to show you that this is in a first step you can do. And if you're motivated, you can follow along some of these exercises and it will help you if you want to delve into it. All right, so I'm going to start taking you through part one. Um, this is about classic recommendation, uh, which is rec we're going to see it as recommendation of auto-completion versus recommendation as intervention of a policy. And we can sort of pose this with what makes a recommended system modern. What do we mean modern, at least in this course? And so let's step back and talk, talk about what we don't mean and what, what is actually most of academic recommendation. And here we see users, and the user is viewing a product from a catalog. So here, this is record gym notation. It's a notation I'm going to use throughout this course and throughout some of our papers that we're going to see that V means an item viewed. So, and, and we're going to index this. So, so moment in time one is V1. So we're seeing that a, a user, V1 equals beer. So users viewing a beer in mo the first moment in time. Then um, we can uh, advance this. The, search, the user is going to view another item and yet another item. And many of our rec classical recommended systems data sets look like this. And if we're building a probabilistic model of this, we can build things like just assuming that we only know this part of the session, the, person, the fact the person fills up, viewed a, um, a beer and a phone, we can look at a, a third item, hold that out, and build a model and predict whether that third item that we're holding out uh, is being reliably predicted or not. And if you think about it, that's really a lot of the way we do evaluation and training on classical data sets. So when thinking about movie lens and things like this, we, we build these models we hold a piece of the data out and we chat test if that prediction is correct. What do these models look like? They're going to be conditional distributions like this. So here, V1 is going to be the first view, V2 is the second view. We're seeing that we've got, we're conditioning on, on, on the first view being a beer and the second view being phone A. And then we see that for the next item that we're going to view, this, this catalog has P items where P equals five. Uh, so we see five probabilities, all that sum to one. So we see the, these numbers. And then we can do an evaluation by looking at what actually happened. And we can say, okay, in this case, it's phone B. And we can ask questions, is this a good model or not? Because, so what does good mean? There are a few things that good will mean. It's putting high probability on the items that happened is, is an indication that, it, that it's good. So in this case, the item that happened is this phone B. It's a second line. You put 0 0.24 probability on it. That isn't too bad. It could be better. It could be worse. Sometimes, though, we, we think in terms of actually we're ranking. What's more important is not 
the uh, the amount of probability we're putting on the item that happened, but how well we ranked it. Um, and that could be that in fact we're we're putting it in the second rank because the first one is put a, we put probability 0.27. The next highest is 0.2, which is the one, 2.4, which is the one that actually happened. So um, in this case, we, we could do a ranking and we can produce classic recommender system metrics like recall at K. So we can sort of say in the case of K equals two, it would be in, but if K equals one, it would be out. Then you can say, okay, the fact that K is a bit arbitrary, maybe we would, what, we're interested in some compromise and we can get more and more nuanced as we go down this path. So all of this is, Good. As I said, Paris is noisy. Um, so we can do this and we can get more and more sophisticated. Sorry, with all of this, I, I, I just realized I've, done, I've got the numbers wrong. The highest, of course, is 0 0.3, 0 0.27 and 0.24. So in fact, it's, uh, it, it would have to be uh, recall at three for this, this item to be in. Um, so um, we can look at what happened and we can talk about whether this is good or not. And we can do this many, many times to produce a metric. The main issue with this is that it's not actually anything to do with recommendation at all. These are just histories of users doing things. And this does resemble you know, data sets that are related to user behavior, but we actually haven't yet seen a recommendation. And we have no idea if we did a recommendation from this data actually whether it would be good or not. When we actually do a recommendation, what's happening is we've seen a user, the viewed items from the, uh, this sequence of length three, but it could be of any length. And then we can place different recommendations on it and observe if the user is going to uh, respond to this recommendation. And in all cases in this course, and often in, in many uh, practical applications, we're gonna assume the reward is a click that happens immediately. So we're not looking at delayed reward, just immediate reward. Uh, delayed reward is far more complicated, but you'll see this is not trivial anyway. So we can iterate through the entire catalog of five items, and we can have a probability of click on each of them. So here I'm in introducing more notation. So this is the fourth item in the sequence. Um, A4 is for action. So we can look at different actions here. We can say the action is recommendation. So the action could be a rice, could be phone, et cetera, et cetera. We can iterate through. And C is for click, and we're only really interested in the case where this is one. So this is kind of clearly not quite the same problem. Uh, in the past, we were looking at, at, the, at predicting what, how a session would end, where the user was behaving on their own. But now we're making a recommendation and we're seeing, would the user respond to this recommendation or not? Um, but if we've built a model using the classic recommender system methods that we're used to, what we've got is uh, this next item prediction model, which is over the catalog of size P, or five in our case, we have five, five numbers that sum to, to one. But in fact, what we want is not this, but the probability of click, given we recommend all of these things. And so there's a very important distinction here that um, we're not trying to predict how, what the user is about to do, but rather are they going to respond to a recommendation? And there's really two, like, we can see that this is different in many ways. It's just simply not the same problem. Uh, the first one, we have P numbers summing to one. In the second one, because we have P recommendations, we're always assuming that the items that someone's view are the same set that we're gonna recommend from. So we have P items in both cases, but in the second set, we'll see that the numbers are, are just probabilities and there's no constraint that they must have added to anything. They're just simply different counterfactual things given when we're doing different recommendations. So in the top, there's a sum constraint where they're all summed to one. In the second, there's no sum constraint at all. But it's also just not the same problem. So it's not the same thing to, to assume that someone is going to complete uh, and, and how they would, would respond to a recommendation. I think it's actually kind of a, a very mundane view of recommendation to think that, that, that these are the same things. With recommendation, you really might hope to make somebody aware of a product or aware of an item that they previously did not know and would not have visited. That's a more interesting recommendation than figuring out how they would complete. Um, so if our model makes predictions like this, so uh, here we're, we're looking at a slightly longer sequence, then it, what we can say is, okay, if we make the assumption that these things are the same, this implicit assumption that I think runs right through classic recommendation, 
we can see that this second loan associated with phone B has the highest uh, next item probability. And so, okay, if we're going to if we're going to make this implicit assumption that these two things are related, what, what, what are we really saying? We're really saying that um, if the next item probability from, from item A is greater than the next item probability from item B, then we should assume that a, a click on, on item, a, the probability of a click or a reward, reward if we recommend item A is greater than the probability of a click or a reward if we recommend item B. And I would kind of contend that really the vast amounts of academic recommendation work that we see in, in conferences like UMAP and REXIS and NeurIPS makes this sort of assumption implicitly. Um, but it's, it's an assumption that may or may not be correct. And in fact, once you're running the recommender system and you have logs of the recommender system, these assumptions at least partially can be tested if you have data that's randomized. And that's really the point of this course. So um, this is, I think, it's a simple point perhaps, but it's really an important point. If, if there's any questions or thoughts about this, it really is a good time to raise them and to discuss them uh, because the entire course is now going to move on to this second part and, and operating this, this second way, which if you're used to classic work, it might be a little bit unfamiliar. Uh, but he, so it's here we're making the break. Classic recommendation can be viewed as auto completion. It's leveraging the organic user behavior. Organic means that the user is interacting with the system before the recommended system is, is uh, being deployed and before recommendations are being given. So we're seeing logs of user behavior. Um, and we frame the problem and we can see it as a missing link, link prediction or a matrix factorization problem or a sequence prediction problem where we're filling in missing pieces of information that we're, that we're removing from the system. The modern approach is recommendation as an intervention policy. So here we're going to leverage what we call bandit user behavior. That's things like ad clicks. When we say bandit in this course, we're not interested in the explore exploit dilemma, which some of the bandit literature is. We're simply bandit is code for the recommender system logs. We're seeing the recommendation and we're seeing was a reward view. Uh, you know, was this recommendation successful? Did we obtain a reward by giving it? And so there's really two ways to do this. We can frame the problem either as a click problem, a click prediction problem using uh, likelihood types methods, or we can use contextual bandit or policy learning problems. And in fact, this will split the course in two. So I will talk about the first part and um, with, with uh, Olivia and, and um, Flavian and me, we'll do the second part. Um, as I said, it's, it's a good time to ask a question if anything is unclear because everything is gonna uh, rest on this. So the advantage of, of this approach is it's an already established framework. It's lots of standard data sets and metrics, and it's easy, easier to publish and compare methods. In fact, this is the classic way we compare methods is we use these data sets when we compute tables of recall of K and other similar metrics. Uh, in real world, the, um, there's lots of good things about using these methods too. The data arises naturally from the user of the application. So if you have a client that doesn't have a recommender system but wants to build one and deploy one, this is the first data you'll see. You, you won't see a recommender system logs if you don't have a recommender system. So you can start to build something uh, before you've even deployed it. Um, these methods have lots of standard and efficient and well-tested implementations. Uh, we know a lot about them and, and it is a good initial system. Auto completion, the, this implicit assumption that I highlighted before isn't a terrible one, it's just not the best one. But there's limitations of the classical approach. Um, we're operating under the assumption that the best recommendation policy is in some sense to order complete the natural user behavior. Um, and this is just not necessarily so. And it, it really, I think, downgrades what the idea of recommendation is. Recommendation should be to find something exciting that the user did not comp uh, previously know about. And so um, I think it's a quite narrow and, and, and unfortunate way to frame a recommendation, actually. Um, also, the autocomplete metrics from the point of, a bit, is, not a, is not an interesting business metric. It can give you a great initial policy because no, there's no feedback available. But what you'll find is you can build and deploy this system, but after a first golden age, you'll start to find these offline metrics like recall at K 
do not align with uh, A-B tests uh, online. And, and uh, you're really needing to do something different to start to improve upon business metrics uh, and things like click-through click rate. Just to highlight sort of how extreme this is, let's start thinking about what are our classic data sets that we're interested in. Uh, things like movie lens are these, so we think about this as a recommender system data set, but uh, is it actually the log of a recommender system? No, it isn't. It's actually just uh, explicit feedback of movie ratings. Again, Netflix Prize is exactly the same framework. Uh, arguably, actually, even though these are perhaps the most popular data sets, they're, they're, not, they're a little bit uh, contrived and we often do strange things with them in order to produce evaluations uh, because most recommended problems and don't look like uh, this explicit movie rating issue. What's closer to a lot of problems that we see is the YouTube data set, which was a Erexis competition a few years back. And this actually does show sequences of items. So it's, it's closer to what a, a real system might, might look like, um, but it still has exactly the same problems. It still contains no logs of the recommended system and on and on 30 music and so forth. So there are a few exceptions. There's the Yahoo newsfeed data set. There's a, a very large Critio data set for counterfactual algorithms for recommended systems. These uh, give propensity scores. They are logs of the recommended system. They're interesting and, and certainly some interesting works come out of them. There are some limitations of them. They'll give you the propensity scores. Basically, we'll, we'll discuss why these are not necessarily a solution uh, to the evaluation problems we're facing uh, a little bit later. Uh, so, but the Credo data set certainly does qualify, chose a log of recommendation, and if they were successful in getting the user to click or not. Um, so again, this is really repeating that, that classic offline metrics, recall at K, precision at K, hit rate at K, really the same thing. Uh, how, I'd, how often is an item in the top K uh, is, is not a recommendation. It, it does not evaluate uh, something that's the log of a recommended system. It evaluates whether you can predict how a session order completes. And something like DCG is really just a refinement on this. It, it's really the exact same type of thing. So there are two things in terms of online metrics that we can really do. Um, we can do actually running an A-B test if, you're, if you work for a company that operates a recommended system and really that's the sort of exclusive group that can do this, you can run a randomized control trial. You can split the population into two groups. You can run two different versions of your recommender system and you can see whether one performs better than another using business metrics or, or metrics you really care about. So it certainly works. It's certainly the gold standard in many senses. And of course, the academic literature has no access to this. It's, it, you really, it really is confined to industry. So using things like the Credio data set, you can use what, something that I'll explain in a little bit more detail called inverse propensity score estimates of the click-through rate. It, it does work in the sense that it will give you a value of the um, at least short-term reward if you, uh, if you evaluate different policies but it can be very noisy and we'll explain this shortly. But the bottom line is if the data set does not contain a log of recommendations and if they were successful or not, you can't really compute metrics of the recommendation quality. You're really forced to making that implicit assumption that I stated earlier. Um, has anyone asked any questions or not or are we ready to, to um, keep moving? I haven't, I'm not seeing anything. I'm gonna keep going. So um, as, as we improve recommended systems, we can import, incorporate the user feedback. So it, it's fine to use some of these organic algorithms to build the initial system, but once you've started to deploy the system, you're starting to gather data and learn about click-through rates and this sort of material. And so once you, once you have this data, you may as well use it. So this is the focus of what we're going to do. So, one way to do offline evaluation that actually does predict A-B test results is to use the IPS score. So we're going to largely follow the previous notation. So capital A will be an action, a V will be an organic view or iteration, a new symbol pi will, is gonna be what we call the recommendation policies. That's is gonna assign the probability that uh, to items 
uh, conditionally on the user's past, and it's going to try to usually recommend good items. So we can imagine that we can have a new recommendation policy pi t. It's going to have some probability of a recommendation given some, some list of historical items. And we, what we want to do is learn how well it will predict if we deploy it when we've collected logs from a different pol policy, pi zero. So I understand this is maybe getting a bit abstract, and, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it a little bit clearer. Um, imagine, so in this case, we're going to have our new policy, pi t. It's going to, in most cases, we're going to assume that the new policy pi t was going to find the recommendation that it thinks is the best and assign probability of one to that and assign probability to, to zero to all other recommendations. In other words, the, the new policy pi t will usually be a degenerate policy. And this kind of makes sense. If, you're going to, if you think something is the best, you just want to do it all the time. There's no reason not to do it all the time. So in this case, the recommendation policy, in the case that a user has viewed uh, a beer, then a phone A, then phone B, it, it thinks that the best recommendation to make is to, make, to recommend phone B, and it's going to do that all the time. In this case, this is the new, new algorithm that we're considering, or the new recommendation policy that we're considering. But there's a logging policy where in the past there was some randomization. We didn't always do the same random same recommendation for a given history. In this case, we've got a history of, of well, the same history. Uh, and most of the time we're going to recommend phone B. So the new policy and the old policy actually agree. But in the case of the old policy, there was there's some randomization, and that's because you need randomization to, to learn in order to to learn off banded feedback, it's important that some of the time you do different actions on the same history in order to tell whether the action was good or not. So there must be some randomization. But in terms of evaluation, it's always cleaner to think about something that's uh, deterministic. Uh, so pi zero will always have some level of randomization. Pi t in most cases will be deterministic. Because the new policy and the old policy are roughly in a, you know, more or less in agreement, that there's only this 0 0.8 here and this one here. When we see a reward or, or a click uh, in, in the historical logs, what we can say is that the new policy is going to do this action that resulted in the click 25% more often than in the, uh, in, in the old policy. So any reward we've observed uh, in, in these sorts of cases where the history agrees and the action agrees, we need to upweight this by 25%. So we're going to find we're always, in fact, under, under this regime I described, whether the new policy is deterministic, we'll always do an upweight. It will just depend on by how much. When they're roughly in agreement, the upweight is small. And here we're seeing a small upweight. But if, there can be times when the new policy is proposing a recommendation that the old policy didn't like or did, would have only done uh, infrequently. So in these cases, uh, here, here we've got an example where the new policy is wanting to recommend rice when there is couscous in the history, but the old policy would have only done this 1% of the time. Now, because this is, this is radically different, any reward we see uh, where everything agrees, the, the, we, we see that we've, got, we've obtained a click, the re past recommendation was rice and the past history was couscous, we need to upweight this by a factor of 100 to do the correct correction. Now, putting in these very high weights when you're computing averages is going to result in lots of variance. And this variance can be very high when the new policy differs from the old policy. So this is the, perhaps the downside of this IPS evaluation. I'm going to now give you the complete formula for it. So that was just giving you the intuition. And there's a little bit more notation. So CN is going to be the click on the nth item. And it'll be one if the recommendation got a click in it, or else it will be zero. We're going to do some reweighting. Also, there's going to be a shorthand of notation. We're going to do some feature engineering of these V1 to Vn. We, we're going to call them X from now on. Um, Olivia will tell, tell you a little bit about how we might, might create this. Uh, one way to do it is to make this a vector of length P and to, and to just compute the, the history of counts for all of them. So, the formula looks like this. It's often called um, important sampling formula. 
and the the simple intuition of it is that you will see as the click so you'll look for the obviously the click when click is zero you, they make no contribution um, you look for times when the history uh, and the recommendation are agree and you see a click and you'll do an appropriate up weighting uh, by this so usually again I'm assuming pi t will be equal to one uh, for one action and zero otherwise and pi zero will have some level of randomization but will often be focused on an action that the previous system thought was good. So the estimator is unbiased, but it can have very large variance due to these potentially high weights. When the new system does items that were done, that when the new system recommends items that were only recommended rarely on the old system. So another potential shortcoming is we're only looking at the clicked items. So anything, so all the non-clicked data gets disposed of it could be argued that, that that is disposing of valuable data. And as I just mentioned a few times, when the new policy differs markedly from the old, the weights can become very high and this can cause uh, considerable variance in the estimator. So, um, so the good thing about IPS though is it is attempting to evaluate the real kind of factual question. Previously, when we think had things like a recall at K, we could have said, well, it seems by this metric that recommended system A is better than recommended system B, but, and we might be able to prove like, that, that this metric is not noisy and that A by the metric really is better than B, but you could always be let down by the fact that this metric might be a poor proxy for real performance. This is a far, far more direct proxy of real performance, and, and it really should give you some indication of how the uh, recommended system will perform uh, in an A-B test. The downside is the um, is really this increased variance that you're seeing. So there's lots of ideas for improving the, the variance of the estimator. A lot of it focus around not doing, not allowing the new recommendation system to stray too far from the old because that's when the variance problems become very severe. But there's lots of ideas for, for countering the variance here and there's some references that, that can help let you go into that in more detail. Again, I think this is another good place to ask questions. It's always hard to tell on these online seminars if the talk is interesting and understandable. So please say something if, if it's a complete mess or if it's reasonably okay. Um, or just rephrase your understanding if you'd like to, if you're not that shy. Anyone? Okay, I'm gonna become difficult and ask you some, some more questions in future, so, so pay attention. Um, <laughs> okay, so recommendation that we're, the, the recommendation that we're following in uh, is really owes a lot to supervised learning and A-B testing, and it's quite a piecemeal process. And let me take you through a, a cartoon view of it. So here we've got this, okay, we called it pi zero before we could also call it pi old. We have a user. So in the view of the recommended system, we can think of the, the recommended system as actually doing things to the user and sometimes the, we're obtaining reward from the user and sometimes not. So it, it might be a little bit the reverse of what you think, but in fact, the, the system will act upon the user and then, you, then it'll observe or not observe a reward from that user. As we do this, there is a lot of uh, data logged. Uh, so the organic data that I discussed earlier and it has an implicit assumption that is useful but questionable, that's logged. And because the implicit assumption is roughly true, it's valuable. We also will see the recommendations made and whether they were successful or not. And, oh, uh, I'll come to the question in one second. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll see value from this. So, um, so um, okay. So, if the old system is, I'm gonna read out the question. If the old system is really bad compared to the new system, variance in IPS will be very high, but how to prove new system is really good compared to old system? So there's two issues I think is it, if we have the new system and the old system, are they, that, that we're comparing? That, so we have a, what we called pi t before and pi zero. So, I was talking about whether they were different or not, and that's usually the way I think the way we think about it. So by different, 
It means are they regularly making similar recommendations that are overlapping or are they regularly making completely different recommendations that are overlapping? And when you do the evaluation, and okay, this is completely logical that we've got a log of recommender system data and we have some new recommendation idea that we think might work. Now, our, our ability to evaluate the um, the new system depends on, on uh, how much of the data, or how often we've seen recommendations that the new system is going to do in the old system. So, uh, so this, the fact that there has to be a good overlap is a requirement so that you can see uh, good estimation. The question though is, is not saying how much overlap there is, but if the recommender, old recommender system is bad. Now, I think that also is a thing because I, as you'll recall, I was talking about how many clicks we observed, and if there were not a lot of clicks in history, only the click data is used in these estimators, and so that also would have an impact. So if the old system is really bad compared to the new system, the variance in the IPS will be high, but how can we pr prove the new system is really good compared to the old? I think there are many situations where the overlap is so high, the variance becomes very high. If the variance becomes very high, it's really saying it's hard to prove. It's hard to know if, if the new system would be better or worse than the, the old system. Um, so, we can, so there's a new question. So we can assume that there will be a lot of mismatch in recommendations of old system and new system. It depends. Uh, one strategy for doing this type of learning is to make small incremental changes between the old and the new, which um, means that, that there's a reason that there'll be less variance in your offline estimation. Um, I don't know if you, if that's answering the question. If, if you're unmuted, feel free to talk as well. Um, uh, okay. So I've got makes sense, thanks for your answer. So I appreciate questions. So um, uh, please ask more. Cheers. Um, so I'll come back to this. It's okay. So we're, 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 we're logging data like this um, from the system. We now have our ML researchers or a team of data scientists are proposing some new model that might be by retraining on the logs and doing something different. And so we have pi old, pi new, and we can compute a bunch of metrics here. We can, and of course we can pr produce IPS type estimators we just discussed, but we could also produce the organic metrics that only sort of had this proxy value. And, um, and we can do both of these things. So the proxy ones are gonna be less noisy. So there is, there is an advantage to them. They're not completely crazy and they're out based on a reasonable assumption. We can then say, start saying, okay, we're seeing that pi new most of the time on most of the metrics we care about is better than pi old. Maybe we should try it. So we can push it to an AP test here. And um, at that point, we really get the final verdict of all of this. So looking at all of this, we can sort of take a step back and say, what's really going on here? Um, we're doing lots of supervised learning from our past algorithms. It's very user intensive based on AP tests. Uh, if, if the things are positive and scalable, we can try and roll out. Um, but maybe we're doing reinforcement learning by hand. And actually, not only in this, but we're doing it in a sort of reinforcement learning using, using one of our favorite tricks, supervised learning. You know, one of the great success stories of machine learning is supervised learning. So uh, it's good, but it's, is it exactly the right framework? Um, and also standard test data sets are not allowing us to, do, to explore this aspect of recommendation. How can we escape this and do something different? So here we turn to some inspiration from uh, the reinforcement learning community and we built the Recogym simulator. And so even though this is simulated and in some sense artificial, we think there's a good case for saying actually it's better than testing on offline data sets, that actually offline data sets are highly artificial. Um, so in doing this, we built something off the OpenAI Gym framework and this solves a problem that's present in the reinforcement community that there's been a lack of standardization for comparing and testing algorithms. So OpenAI Gym is really a software standard. It's a fairly basic Python API with just a relatively full, 
small number of uh, calls. And the core idea is that you can uh, define the problem using agents uh, and reinforcement learning algorithms and try to solve it by uh, repeated interactions. So it looks more like a real recommender system. And in fact, we don't need the full color and the full complexity most of the time of RL for recommender systems, particularly, for example, here, as here we are only looking at immediate reward. So this is why we introduced the RecordGym simulator. When I spoke right at the start about some timelines and what's going on with our views and then recommendations, it's exactly the same. It, we, it generates timelines of this sort. And uh, the first timeline we see it is an e-commerce website. So the user is viewing products at, in that website. So this is the organic behavior. The user is not interacting with the recommender system at this point in time. At some point later, they will read a newspaper and go to a publisher website. And at this point, ad advertisements containing recommendations will be delivered to the user. And um, the, these may, might be good or bad recommendations. And some of the recommendations the user might like and then click on and that will drive them back to the uh, e-commerce website. So that's the basic behavior we have. What's important about Record Gym that changes things is that it allows online evaluation of recommendation policies in a simulated environment. So simply speaking, we can do a, a simulated A-B test for any type of algorithm, be it an organic one or a banded orientated one or one that combines the two. All of these can be pulled together. And so it gives a holistic view of the user, the organic and the band feedback. And it provides a framework for categorizing recommendation algorithms. There's a really important feature because, so that, that implicit assumption that I mentioned at the start, that auto completion is a good idea. Uh, that can be very much the case or it can be not so much the case. And so there's a key feature in, recommend, uh, in Record Gym that allows you to interpolate between it being pretty much exactly what you want to do, next item completion, uh, or good organic metrics are exactly correlated with online metrics, to not so correlated. It'll never be completely not correlated, but it will always, but, but you can certainly weaken that correlation by tuning the Record Gym parameters. So what's within Record Gym is a simulation environment. It's not a secret. As we do exercises, although we're going to do them fairly briefly here, someone always says, well, how does it work? Is it a, is it a sensible simulator, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a secret how it works. It's, you can look at the source code or you can look at this algorithmic block. And if someone starts asking more questions, we'll move back to this slide. But uh, it's simply really here to say that it's a fairly simple algorithm based on a dynamic like matrix factorization type model. There's a slightly different matrix for the organic and banded behavior, and that parameter controls the difference. So um, at this point in time, we can have our first dip into record gym. And I think if Olivia is ready, he can take over here. Is that all good to go? Yep. Okay, That's so I'll stop sharing. Um, by the way, are there any questions at this point? I'll start sharing. There seems to be nothing. OK. Um, is my screen shared? Yes. OK. Sounds great. Um, all right, so you can find links to the notebooks in the slides. Um, or you can just go to GitHub and go to this uh, repository. And then under the notebooks folder, you will, you will see the ones that we, we actually have here. Um, in most of these notebooks, there are going to be some sort of code blocks uh, that you need to fill in um, where the code is not there yet um, because they were actually meant as some sort of exercise. Well, we noticed that it's a little bit hard to do this sort of stuff um, completely remote. So um, the notebooks that I will be going over are actually the ones that you have in this solutions folder. Um, so that might be simplest to, to sort of uh, get these running on Google Collab and then you can just follow along. So. Um, the By first... the way, is, is, where do people get the link for this? Is it uh, maybe is it easy to just post that paste that into the the chat? It might be uh, yeah. if I can find the chat box. But it, it's something that disappears at the worst time. I, um, it seems like there is no chat box when you're sharing your screen. So yeah, it seems, it seems that I can maybe on Slack. Yeah, I think on Slack it's going to be more practical. That way it's archived and it will not disappear after the, the end of the webinar. That's, that's true too. Okay. okay. 
So that's oh, what... um, in fact, thank you, uh, Alessandro. All right, then uh, let's deep dive. Um, so this, this first notebook is really just meant to give a, a sort of bird's eye view of, of what is RecoGym and, and how do you actually use it um, to try to, to simulate um, a, a sort of recommender system uh, in this way. So first of all, just uh, some nice figures to sort of drive home the point that this is very different than doing something with, for example, a standard movie lens data set. Here, we're going to have a user. We're going to observe the user's organic behavior. Uh, but then aside from that, we're also going to make certain actions, show stuff to the user, and then we will observe whether the user actually clicks or doesn't click on a recommendation. And maximizing the, the reward that we actually get over time, that is going to be the, the goal of our new system, instead of basically trying to predict what you're going to observe as this, this user's organic behavior. So once again, you have the organic behavior, which are just user views. This is basically data that you observe. And then bandits data is what you're actually going to um, observe based on, an, um, on a, a certain action that, that you made um, as an agent. Um, there are basically two ways to look at this. Um, you can either first look at learning completely offline. So you will have a, a certain data set where there was a certain policy, which is the uh, BBS or sort of Pi Zero uh, that David was uh, sort of talking about, um, where you have a policy that took a certain action and then there was a certain reward. Um, and then you can use this, this sort of fixed data set, a log of previous recommendations to learn from. And that is what we are going to be focusing on. Um, a lot of research in, in, in the sort of bandit um, stuff is also sort of about learning online. Um, but that is a whole sort of different sort of box of Pandora that we will not uh, be sort of opening today. Um, so, OK, how do, does this work? Well, first of all, uh, you have to import Jim. You have to import Greco Jim. The first stuff is just some pretty standard sort of boilerplate code. Um, you have to make the environment with Jim. Uh, you have to do resets um, when you, you start simulating a user. Uh, this is all pretty standard stuff. Um, and then we can actually start simulating. So we can just say, OK, we, we just did uh, the uh, reset. So we're now going to start simulating a user. Uh, we're going to do a step completely offline, meaning that we are not the ones who are actually showing recommendations now. There's just going to be a, a fixed policy in the background that's uh, going to be showing recommendations uniformly at random, actually. And when we're just going to observe, OK, what happened? Which action was taken? Uh, which organic observations do we have? What was the reward if there was a reward? And are we done with this user or not? And then once you actually start looping over this, you can see, OK, the first, um, the first step actually was just observation. So we have a sort of organic page view, uh, user u, um, uh, user 0, at time 0, had a page view for item 0. And there is no reward because, of course, we didn't actually show anything as a recommendation. And then we start actually showing recommendations. And you can see that then on times one, two, and three, uh, the actions that were taken are actually action three, four, and five. Uh, and there is no reward here. Um, so if you want to have more um, of like some sort of explanation of what these, uh, sort of, um, these things all mean, uh, that's all here in the notebook. I will not be going over it too much. Uh, but it's all there if you need more of a reference. Um, now. We can, of course, also choose which recommendations we're actually going to show. So suppose you really just want to show uh, like a, a very simple first example. We're going to just show uh, product one, product two, product three, product four, and then product five. That actually happens in, in a very similar way, the only difference being that here we, we're going to use the step function of the environment instead of the step offline function that we actually had here. And then when you do that and you print out what you get, you can actually see, OK, first we observe this user 0 with a page view now for the item 1. And then you can see that, OK, we're going to show um, the action 1. There's no reward. We're going to show action 2. There's no reward. Show action 3. There's no reward. And that's um, because we're looping over these, these, these sort of actions here. Of, of course, the, the, the trick in the end is to produce an agent that gets more reward 
by of choosing course. protections. This is just to demonstrate the API. Exactly, exactly. So um, suppose you want to make um, a sort of agent that does something a little bit more sensible. Uh, that is what we're going to, to do now. Um, so one of the things you can actually do is, is basically something that's, that's been used a lot uh, in the, in the Rexy sort of literature. Uh, we're just going to use a baseline that's going to, to go for the most popular item. Um, and the most popular here is going to be based on the organic interaction. So we're just going to look, okay, based on, on our logging data, um, how often is each product actually being viewed in an organic way? And then we're going to show the product that is actually going to be, the, uh, be, be viewed um, the most often. Uh, so how do we actually do this? Well, we need a certain agent. This is going to be the class. We're going to need, um, of course, a constructor. We're going to need a train method. We're going to need a certain acting method. Of course, the train method is just going to learn from a certain logged uh, data set. And then the act method is the thing that is actually going to start producing um, certain recommendations uh, for users. So what do we need in the constructor? Well, we're going to just need a, a vector of length p, if we have p different products, because we're just going to count how, um, sort of how often each product is being viewed. And then in the training data, we're just going to go over the observations, which is the organic data. We're not going to use the bandit data yet. And then we're just going to see, OK, for every um, organic interaction that we have, we're going to look at this v, which is the item that was viewed. And we're just going to do a small increment of the count for that item. And then when we are going to act, we're going to say, OK, maybe just showing the most sort of popular item the entire time is not something we want to do. Um, we might want to, want to sample. So what we're going to do is we have these, these counts of these views. We're going to normalize them just by dividing over the sum. And then we just have something that sums to 1, so we can just sample um, from these as a sort of, yeah, uh, okay, sample from these using NumPy. Uh, and that is now the, the very simple sort of agent that we're going to use. Um, and of course, this is not going to be a great recommender, but you might think that it's already going to be much better than, than just a completely random recommender, for example. Um, so suppose we actually want to see how this is now going to work. Well, we're going to make this agent, which is happening here. We're going to reset the environment. And we're going to say, OK, let's just train based on 1,000 users. So we're going to compute uh, the organic views, uh, these sort of counts for 1,000 users. And then we are going to evaluate how this agent is actually doing by letting it sort of interact with 100 online users that we're going to simulate. And then the agent is actually really going to be what is showing the recommendations, sampling the actions. And then we see how often we actually get a reward. Um, so in the beginning, it's going to be the step offline function because we're not the ones who are actually going to show these recommendations. We're just going to loop over the number of, all, um, of users. When you do reset, a new user is actually uh, sort of uh, sampled by the environment and then going to be simulated. And we just say, OK, while we're not done, we're going to observe what happens. We're going to take a step. And then we're going to put this information that we get um, from this offline step into the training function of our agents. And that one is just going to count, OK, how often is each item actually being viewed? Once we have this, uh, we have a fully trained agent. And then we can actually start running it um, on users. So if we say, OK, we're going to simulate 100 users online and then track the CTR, um, this basically works very much the same. You just reset the environment. But now, as I said, you're going to take a step and the step function is actually going to ask for a certain action. So what happens is we're going to make the agent act based on um, the observations that we have. They don't really matter here because it's, not, um, it's an agent that is not really sort of personalized. It just is going to sample from the, the same probability uh, for basically um, all the users, um, but still. So here we. we sample the action, we give the action to the environments, and then we observe the reward. And then we can see, OK, when the reward is 1, this means that we actually got a click. So then we're going to count that. And when the reward was 0, then we don't have a click, but we still want to sort of um, have like some sort of counter that, that says that we actually showed something, and then we can look at the, the CTR. 
And then when you actually compute this as a number of clicks over the number of times you actually show the recommendation, we can see that here we have a CTR of around 1.3%, which is not super impressive, uh, but rather uh, normal um, in a real world system to see these sort of numbers. Um, now, suppose we want to know whether this is actually doing better than a uniformly random agent. Uh, we can actually sort of get like this um, big block of code in a, in a much more concise way, um, because this is basically what you want to do with, with RicoGym pretty often. Uh, so there are a few functions for that. Uh, first of all, we're just going to reset the environment. We're going to now make two agents, this best of agent as the one we, we just described. And then there's going to be a random agent, um, which is just um, a fully random agent that is going to sample the actions uniformly at random. Uh, and that's one of the agents that, that's sort of standards already included in, in Raycochip. Then you can use the test agent function, which is going to first uh, do um, a, a run um, with a thousand offline users to actually train the agent. And then, oh, this doesn't really matter. Um, and then it's going to um, do a sort of online experiment with another thousand users and then give you a certain confidence interval for the, the click-through rate. So we can run this with the random agent, as we see here. We can also run this with the best of agent, as we see here. And then we can sort of start comparing these results. And we see that, OK, in this case, the random, uh, the random, agent, sorry, the random agent actually has a far lower CTR than the best of agent. Um, so even though it's not super sophisticated, it's, it's already working a little bit better. And then um, this uh, is the, the uh, I think, 95% confidence interval that you see. Um, and you can see that it's actually, uh, it's no longer within noise. Um, and what's actually nice about Greco Gym is that because you were basically running uh, the show, when these numbers would still be within noise, you can just run it for, for um, a longer time with more sort of online users. And then you would hope that you would get a much, much more tight sort of confidence interval. Uh, so that was the first simple notebook, uh, just showing basically what you would use Recojump for and, and, and how you would, uh, you would go about this. Um, I think the next one is also for now, yes. So now we're going to move on to doing something a little bit more useful, um, which is uh, basically looking at the differences between the organic interactions and the, the banded interactions. Um, so first of all, this is just a little bit of simple sort of boilerplate code. We're going to say, okay, we're gonna have uh, an environment with 10 products, uh, which is not super so realistic, but it's, it's much simpler to, to um, do it like this now. Um, and then we're going to say, OK, uh, the, uh, the, the sigma mu organic is 2, um, and sigma omega is also 2. These numbers are not too important. It's, it's basically just um, what is making the simulator work in, in the background. Um, but then we can say, OK, what we want to do is we have the environments. We, we want to get logs for 8,000 users. And then we can actually start looking at what data is now actually being, uh, being sort of simulated. So first of all, this T is just the time. This U is a user. And then you have certain organic interactions and certain banded interactions. And the organic interactions come with a certain item that is being viewed, which is this V. The banded um, sort of interactions are going to come with a certain action that was shown. Then whether you get a click and then a coincidence score. I can see that there is a question. So let me go over it, if I can actually see it. I can read it, if you like. That would be nice, because I'm, uh, I'm sharing my screen, and I don't see, oh, no. I think now I can see it. Um, OK, so the question is, if I got it right, you can specify the sampling strategy for the action to take. I guess the strategy could take into account content information, such as uh, such as an artist's name or loudness, for example, in a music rexus. Um, yes, exactly. Um, we don't really simulate something like uh, sort of content for the items uh, in Rico Gym right now. 
Um, but that is certainly something that you could use um, to, to um, base your, your sampling strategy on. If that is something that is uh, sort of answering your question. Uh, I'm going to say that it's answered, but if it's not, please just, ah, okay, that's clear. All right, um, so as I was saying, you're going to have the organic interactions, the bandit interactions that have an action, um, a click or not, and then you have this certain uh, propensity score. For now, this propensity score is just going to be one over P when you have P products, um, because that is just the, 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 the sort of simplest part for now, um, which means that you're just sampling uniformly at random. Uh, which is also not super um, realistic, but for now, uh, we're going to stick with that. Okay, so that's that. Um, now, we can sort of have a look at how this data sort of looks like. So we said in the previous notebook that it might be a good idea to have a look at um, sampling the items based on how um, much they're actually viewed sort of organically. Then we said, okay, we can also look at the, the CTR that we get for a, a certain agent. Um, now, it might be interesting to actually see whether they are the same thing and, and whether they are very far apart or, or very sort of closely related. So first of all, the first thing we're going to do is uh, plot a certain histogram of the number of actions that we took sort of um, per product which is going to be flat, which is basically exactly the reason why these propensities are all the same, because we're just sampling um, this stuff sort of uniformly at random. Uh, so this is a very sort of boring plot, but it's good to know that it's actually doing what we want it to do. Um, but then it might also sort of be interesting to see, okay, we took these actions completely at random, but that doesn't mean that they are going to be clicked sort of um, completely at random. Some of these items are just going to be more likely to get a click than some others. So then we can also look at a histogram like that. You can see exactly that it's different. So here, for example, um, the for product zero uh, is getting much, much more clicks than, for example, product four, which I think is the lowest. Product seven is also doing much more decently than, than sort of those others. And once you have those two plots, you can actually start looking at um, um, a sort of um, wait, um, a, <clears throat> wait, I'm sorry. Um, so when you have the, the number of recommendations and the number of clicks, you can actually start looking at um, a certain confidence interval that you get for the click-through rate for each product when you're showing them uniformly at random. Uh, so that is exactly what we are going to do here. This is just a little bit of sci-fi. Uh, and this is all just um, a few lines of code just to get a, a nice plot, but then it looks like this. And you can see, okay, we think that the CTR for our product zero is gonna be somewhere around this sort of 1.9%, I think. Whereas for the product four, um, it's going to be much lower. It'll be somewhere around, around one. Um, and once you have this, you can actually start building a certain agent that is going to make use of this bandit stuff instead of just the organic stuff. And that is basically exactly the, the um, goal of Reiko Gym to, to actually make this um, something that that's, um, um, right. to make this actually something that you can do um, because that is really hard with, with uh, the normal uh, data sets these days because they just don't have information about the, the bandit stuff. Um, so we are going to make a greedy bandit based agent. Why greedy? Because it will just take uh, the action that it thinks is the best and it's not going to sample or anything. It will just say, okay, um, based on this, if I'm not going to personalize, the best thing I can do is just take the action zero the entire time, because that one is giving me the, the highest CTR when I am not doing uh, anything fancy. So to do this, we are just going to get a uh, simple uh, class that is going to be the single action agent. When it's going to act, it is just going to basically always do its preferred action. So there is no sort of training function here. We are just when we make the agent, we are going to say, okay, you are an agent that is always going to do this action. Um, so doing this for the, the sort of greedy bandit agents, we're going to say, okay, the item with the highest CTR is item zero. And then we have our first sort of bandit-based agent that is always going to take action zero. 
Now we can also do this uh, similarly to the, the previous notebook um, for the data uh, from the organic views and then look at which sort of item is then the most popular and then um, sort of have an agent that is always going to recommend the most popular item. Um, so if you look at the data of the product views, we can see that that is also very, very different than, than the, the uh, basically CTR. So here we see that whereas you would say that um, purely based on the banded data, your action zero is the best one and action seven is the second best one. When you look at the organic views, you can actually see that the action seven um, is far, far more popular, but the product zero, for example, is only, I think, in fourth place, for example. And products two, four, and six, um, and five, for example, are really, really not being viewed often, but they still get a rather decent CTR and even a better CTR than some other items here. So we might then look at a plot that is actually looking at, okay, for the number of organic views, what is then the CTR that you get? You can see that it's super noisy, but here we have a slight, a small sort of correlation, which is something that you might expect in a real world system as well. When you have an item that is really, really popular, it might not be the best recommendation, but it might be a decent indication that it's also not a bad recommendation. Um, so then we have the organic best of agents that is always going to take the action with the, the most number of uh, views here, which is action seven. Then we have that. Um, and then we can also run these in an A-B test and see which one is actually doing better. Um, so here uh, we are using a different function than in, in the sort of previous uh, notebook because we don't need to actually train these agents. We're just going to verify uh, their, their uh, sort of CTRs. Um, and we're going to do this with 5,000 users for each and every uh, sort of agent. Uh, and this takes something like two minutes. And then we can have a nice plot uh, where we see, okay, the random agents is actually really not doing that well. The greedy organic uh, one is doing already a lot better, but the bandit agent is actually the one that is, that is winning here. Um, and when you would lower or increase this, this number of 5,000, of course, it's going to take longer Then you would see these sort of confidence intervals uh, shrinking uh, and, and becoming more, more tight. Okay, um, this was the first exercise. I think we're going to go back to the slides now. Um, if there are some more questions, uh, we'd be happy to take them or we can just move on. Yeah, if anyone's running anything, then feel free either now or later to get in touch with us and we'll, we'll help if we can. Um, and actually, I think, I think an interesting exercise to think about, let me share screen as well, uh, is so Olivia showed you what we call a banded best of. There's the organic best of. That's pretty clear. You take, take the most popular product, you recommend this. Um, what is the banded best of? Uh, what, why, so uh, why is that difficult? It's actually like Olivia was able to compute it, but that was due to some fairly peculiar circumstances. And I'm wondering if anybody would like, like to, any brave person would like to try and answer that question. Why, why is a bandit best of a hard thing to, to uh, establish on a real system? Does anyone have any ideas? Is anybody out there? Um, you could show the you can try answering in chat or you can feel free to talk if you would like to anybody at all by the way David I don't know if I'm the only one but um, I don't see your screen yet okay okay can you stop sharing that share again yep let me try again is it yeah is now, it, now it's good okay so come on <laughs> Why, what, what, what's complicated about bandit best ofs? Why is it hard to measure this? Any, any thoughts? So what's usually happening is that you've got not, not a completely random system, which was the example that Olivia showed, where you just, your logs are on random data. You've got a personalized system running. 
And it, it might well be that your personalized system is successfully, some of the recommendations it's delivering to the right user and some of them it's not delivering to the right user. So if you were to simply look at the, ignore all the history, ignore all the, the, the recommendations you're doing, just look at recommendations and the click-through rates on them, uh, you would, in the cases where you're doing good recommendation, you would get good scores. In the cases where you're not, you get poor scores. That's an example of Simpson's paradox. So you can't simply do this. You'd have to do quite a lot more complicated analysis to work out a bandit best of on a real system, where an organic best of is reasonably simple. Um, okay, so um, we're just finalizing this first part of the difference between classic and order, uh, modern recommendation. And we've got this table here that, that really differentiates some of, some of these ideas. So classic record can be thought of auto completion or predicting missing links or missing entries in a session where modern record is all about intervention. If you intervene, what's the reward for this? In terms of feedback, the, the data we train on, classic RECO is, is the organic data. It's, it's the data where there is no recommended system log, where modern RECO is the better data, which precisely means the recommended system log. Uh, in terms of classic recommendation, we have um, the model is predicting the item that you're going to view, so one of P products, and there'll be um, a number summing to P, number summing to one. In the terms of modern RECO, when we're predicting whether a reward will be received or not, you'll either receive a click or no click. So this is closer to a binary classification. In terms of doing a transform of, of our parameters for uh, going to a product ID, the correct transform to convert the real line of, or like a real vector onto, onto the simplex, which is what you, we need, you need to do a softmax transform where you would use some, your favorite sigmoid to do uh, a, a click. Um, the metrics for classic recommendation are really like, are we successfully auto completing? So it's recall at K, um, these types of metrics. Where for modern reco, really what we want is online, online A-B test, but you, we could also use simula simulations in an offline environment or inverse propensity scores, which will give us potentially high variance, but un unbiased estimators of performance. Classic RECO is, and I think it's one reason it's so popular is it's, it's nice to use a real data set and you can evaluate on a real data set. What's tricky about modern RECO and to make contributions to the academic literature is the, the fact that you really can't easily simulate, uh, go to A-B test. And so we, we need to use uh, simulators or propensity scores. So we're pl very pleased. We've actually had some papers except for the KDD that are using RECO gym now. So. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more traction and more people other than us will be publishing on it. In terms of real world deployment, classic recommendation is really the initial solution before you have the recommended system logs and you have seen what works and modern record was the advanced solution after you've deployed it, you've run it for a while, you're starting to use the logs to refine that solution further. Um, so up until this point, we've talked about the differences, we've talked about the evaluation and the metrics, and we've introduced a record gem simulator. We haven't yet covered how you might train off the recommender system logs. So that's a pretty important element of the course. Um, so when we're looking at the actual logs, the bandit feedback or the logs of the recommender system, we've got the data that looks like X. X is, is a compression of the history into something of fixed dimension. So it was what was previously V1 to V something. Yeah, the AN being the, uh, the action or recommendation and C being the click or the reward. So we, we're seeing logs that look like this. And so this is making it look like supervised learning, I suppose. So the most straightforward, but it's not the only way, it was also in the second part, is to frame. Um, I think that your slides are not being shared, David, because um, I can see a, a fixed screen, but it's not the slide that you're talking about. Okay, sorry. Um, let me, apologies for that. Um, yes, that's much better, all right. So 
So we're seeing logs of this form. And the easiest way to do this is to say that we can take the user history, the X, we're going to combine it with A and we're going to predict C. Um, and if we're going to do this using maximum likelihood, using the simplest thing we could imagine, we're going to just, just build features of X and A uh, to predict C using uh, logistic regression. And we're, here we're going to be not Bayesian and take a, a point estimate. If you're curious about the Bayesian approach, we're going to present that at, at tutorial at Rex's. Um, so in doing this, we're going to build a logistic regression that looks like this. So it's actually fairly simple what's going on here. X is the history. We're going to concatenate with the recommendation. So basically we're saying the features of this model are the combination of the items the, the user was interested in the past, some representation of this. We're going to, going to then concatenate that with um, the recommendation we're going to give. The recommendation we're going to use what people are now calling one hot encoding, one of encoding. So it'll be, it'll be a vector of length P with the, the uh, recommendation given will be highlighted as, as a one number. And the X could be many things, but a really simple representation that we often use, especially when the number of products is small, is just to simply have a category sum and to count the items that the user is ever interested in. So we'll concatenate these two together. And we're going to apply some uh, function that's going to map these to a high dimensional space. Uh, here, once we've done that, we've, here we'll have the uh, parameters beta and um, and then we're going to apply the logistic sigmoid and sample the reward from like this. So we're interested in learning this, this value beta that will predict the reward for any history and action combination. Now, here's where I ask another question and maybe someone will step up this time or not. But uh, why is this piece necessary? Does anyone have any ideas? Would anyone like to, to hazard a guess why it's necessary to have this nonlinear function? If I remove this, why can I not just concatenate these two together and then have a beta here? Um, I'm not seeing anyone try to answer, but maybe have a think about it. The... Um, Okay, so if you were not to apply this, what's going to happen? We can view, view this as then we're going to multiply X with, by one part of beta and A by another part of beta and add them together. That we can actually break it down like this. And that actually implies that there is no personalization going to happen. The X will multiply by a certain part of beta and we'll say, okay, users with this history have this sort of level of clickiness and in fact, we could call this a banded best of. This piece of, of uh, uh, the A will multiply another bit of beta and give some measure of whether this is a good, or good item to recommend in general. But we're missing no terms interacting between these. And in order to get personalization, it's obviously mandatory that there, is, there are elements of beta that uh, pertain to like interacting terms between this. So in terms of how to do this and how to produce interactions, the simplest thing that we can do, and it's what we usually do in our record gym notebooks, is to take a cross or a chronica product of the X and the A. So if X was a vector of the sum, like the category sum of the, uh, the item, so a vector of length P with P products, giving you new counts, and the A will be one, one of N coding of the action that we're taking, then we can apply a cross between this. And this really extends the dimension of this. So it goes from P to P squared, and it includes all the interactions between every action and every item in history. Uh, obviously that produces a large jump in a dimension. And so the um, more modern approaches, although we're not really covering it in this course because we keep P fairly small, is to use embedding methods and to have an embedding for X and an embedding for um, mu, and in fact, this is, is typically what's done in a real production system. And it's really the betas are actually hidden in the embeddings here. Um, any questions, please speak up. So once we've done this, actually this is just a classification problem. It's just a logistic regression. We can maximize log likelihood like this. And so that's good. And we're seeing we're using the clicked and non-clicked data like this. 
Um, so a brief par parenthetic remark here is um, sometimes we're, it's actually slightly off, 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 what, off the rest of the course. So, um, but we sometimes show two recommendations at once and something that might be a, an interesting thing to do is to look at the recommend. If we show two, two or more recommendations at once, assume the one they interacted with is the good one and the one, the other ones are poor. And this isn't, a, this is a still a, like a proxy approach, like recall at K because it's not aligned exactly with anything like click through rate, uh, but it is a banded approach and it might be a very useful one. So there are losses associated with this. And here we've got, got an action or recommendation that succeeded and a recommendation that failed. Uh, and there are many things you could do with this. Uh, and this is one, uh, but it's slightly off the rest of the course. So, once we've built our model, how are we going to use it to act and how is it going to work? So what our reward model does is it says, okay, well, here's a, here's a user history and give me a recommendation. I'll tell you whether I think that we'll get a click or not on this. So it's called a value-based model because for every possible uh, action, we can make a prediction about whether we will re receive reward or not. Uh, including actions we don't know very much about, actually. Um, so we need to firstly build the model and, and then predict the action for everything. And then at decision time, we're going to evaluate across all these possible actions given the user context. Um, if we're going to make a deterministic policy, and as I said, it's, it's very often theoretically nice at this point to think about just taking the best action at any point in time, even though later you will randomize a little bit. Um, so this is what we're going to do. Uh, we have the problem of we're going to map a user features X into a dense representation U, and we're going to take the products into a representation V. And what we're actually doing is we're doing a big matrix multiply, maximizing over uh, the action, that, finding the action with the, the largest dot product U dot V. So this exactly corresponds to a maximum inner product search. And this fortunately is a very well studied problem to do it by enumeration, by computing every possible dot product that's required. So this means going through your entire catalog of items, which maybe is millions, you don't want to do the dot product uh, for every item at recommendation time. At, at large scale recommendation systems like Critter, you want to do this very, very fast. This is where we need something like a maximum in a product search that is approximate, but will give you this maximum very quickly. And when it's not exactly right, it still gives a good answer. So there's a bunch of these algorithms and there's citations to them and uh, they're very important for the deployment of these algorithms. Of course, it ha has to be this linear part. This is a linear model here. It only corresponds to the, this linear part of the model. Um, so now we're going to look at building a model um, using pure band of feedback and once again, um, I'll let Olivia step in to, to show you the final notebook for this part of the course. All right. Um, OK, so this is going to be the final notebook for the first part. Um, and then there will be a 30-minute break. So hang in there for a little longer, uh, and then we can all sort of have some coffee. Um, OK, so what we're going to do here is we're going to first um, get a, a training log uh, of, of sort of um, this sort of training data that we're going to use for our model. Uh, then we are going to build an agent that can actually learn from it. And then we're going to uh, simulate an A-B test uh, and see whether it actually performs well. Um, so this first code is again, just a lot of uh, code to, uh, to sort of set it up, um, which is not super important. We are going to, um, get logs from the environments for 4,000 users, which is here, this, this data. This will take about a minute, uh, so that's why it's already run for you. And then we're going to see, okay, how are we now actually going to do uh, this, um, this uh, sort of cross product that David mentioned. So we are going to look at a user sort of representation 
as a vector of size b, where each different index in this vector is going to be a number, which will just mean how often has this user um, actually seen uh, this sort of item. Um, so for example, when you have 10 different products, this might be what uh, a user looks like. It has seen product three, seven times, product seven, eight times, product eight, 11 times, and the other products uh, he or she has not seen. Then what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a model that is going to predict the probability of a click. This is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, the probability of a click given a certain product and given this V being uh, this, this, this user. Um, so we have this V, that's this, this vector. Now we want to, to get some notion of what is actually the, the product that we are going to recommend. So we are going to use a one-hot encoding for the action, which means that this is also going to be a vector of length P. It's going to be mostly zeros and it's going to be one, one. So here, this um, is the action uh, that is corresponding to action eight. When we start counting at zero, then it's zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, uh, this is um, uh, the number eight. Okay, if we're then going to do the sort of cross product, what you will actually get is a vector of size P squared, or you can look at it as a, a P by P matrix, uh, which is actually simpler. And then you basically just get a row for each different action. It's going to be zero basically everywhere except the row that is corresponding to this action. Um, so you are going to blow up your matrix, uh, but it's going to be very, very sparse. Um, so there are actually some, some uh, things that you can do to still make this work um, rather fast. Okay, uh, so starting from, from this, this uh, sort of log of recommendations, how can we get a data set that has basically this as the features that we have, and then has a label being a zero or a one, uh, whether this product being shown in uh, this um, sort of context um, sort of got a click or, or not. Um, so here we just have some, some nice classes. This is the, um, the count feature provider. I will not be sort of going over it in too much detail, uh, but, but this is all just to, to sort of handle this, this stuff nicely. Um, we have a function that is building the training data based on the logs and based on how we actually want this stuff to look like. We're going to go over all of our logs. For each row, we're going to see, okay, if this is a new user, then we have to um, reset um, our sort of running counter variables. Um, if we have an organic view, this means that we need to uh, do a certain update of um, the, the vector that we have as a sort of user um, vector. And then when we have a bandit event, we actually need to add the current user vector and the action and then the, the observed rewards um, to our training data set. And that is what is happening here. So when you have a bandit event, you're going to observe based on the feature provider. So this is just going to give you this, this vector with these counts. And then we're going to put this in our user states that we want. We're going to append the action to the actions, the click to the rewards, and the propensity score to the probability of the actions as well. And then this is what we get in the end. Um, so now if we, based on the data that we uh, got a, a little bit earlier, if we're now going to call this function build training data, we're going to get this all nicely in these different variables. Um, and just to give you a, a, a small um, sort of example, this might look like this. So for example, if we have a user that has seen, for example, the product zero never, product one and two once, product uh, three never and product four um, for a number of 18 times. And in the training sample, we have shown this user uh, recommendations for six, one, and eight, and we never got a click, then this is basically what it's going to look like. Okay, so now we have our data, we can actually start learning from it. So we're going to build a simple likelihood-based agent that is going to perform a logistic regression based on this data. So once again, we have a train function and we have a certain act function. The train function is first going to build this training data based on the logs. So now we have this nicely. And then we're going to um, do this sort of chronicler product, which we do here. So that is this small helper function. Yeah, um, that is going to um, 
sort of builds this matrix of size p by p with lots and lots of zeros and one row that is actually corresponding to the action and the user state, which is exactly what, what you see here. So it's going to be zeros, but um, um, this row is actually just going to be a copy of the, the user state. Once we have this, we have the features, we have the rewards. We can just uh, let uh, the, the um, learner uh, just fit the model based on the features and, and trying to um, predict the rewards. This is for the training part. If now we are going to need the model to um, show actually a recommendation to a user, what is going to happen is you're just going to try to make a prediction for each and every action. And then you are going to take the action that you think has the highest probability of actually leading to a click. So what happens here is we have a, uh, a different uh, function that is going to help us, which is the, the score products function, which is just going to um, sort of get these features for each and every action, not just for the actions that actually happened in your training sample. But once you have that for each uh, sort of action, you can uh, put this in your model, and then you will get um, a predicted, uh, a, predicted uh, a predicted probability of a click um, for each and every action, which is what happens here. And then you get these scores, for, uh, which is what you do here. And then we are just going to look at the action that has the highest probability of actually leading to a click. OK. That's that. Once we have that, we can have a look at what that, actually, um, what that will actually look like. So for the same example user, the one that, that watched, for example, um, product number four uh, for a number of 18 times, if we then would show the action six, this is going to be what your features are actually going to look like. So you will have many, many zeros. And then um, at uh, position 60, uh, or 70 in this case, you will actually get a copy of the, the user state, and then the other rows are going to be zeros again. OK. Um, so we can actually start building this agent. We can train it on the data, which is also going to take a while. Um, and then we can actually start uh, running this in a simulated A-B test to see whether it's actually going to work. Um, here we have another standard agent that is already included in Recogym the organic user events counter agent. Um, this is an agent that is actually based on this user state. It's going to take an argmax. So here it's going to uh, show um, the action number seven, because that is the one that has been organically viewed most often by this user. So this is not the same as in the previous notebooks, because this one is actually doing something a little bit more fancy, because it's uh, based on the user and not just based on, on the the entire uh, sample. So once we have that, we can run these against each other with a number of 2,000 users. We can look at the results, and then we can see, ta-da, the likelihood-based uh, agent is actually doing a, a, a pretty good job. If you see that the random agent was uh, at 1.2% CTR, the, the likelihood-based uh, agent is actually able to get uh, to around like 2%. Um, now, this all looks extremely nice. But of course, we are looking at um, a sort of action space of size 10, which is not super um, normal. Uh, and we are looking at learning from data that has been logged uniformly at random. And that is also not something that, that you will actually have in the, in the normal case. Um, and that is actually what the, the rest of the course is going to focus on, uh, where these things actually fall short and how we can um, look at, at ways to mitigate this. OK, that was uh, this exercise. I will stop sharing my screen. And then David can take over again if he's ready. OK, mic back on. Sharing right. screen, hopefully the right one. This is it. Yes, this looks okay. fine. So I'm going to quickly say, so, so now we know a way, at least one way to train on, on the bandit feedback or the recommended system logs. Is it a good way and does it suffer from any issues? And the fact they ask a question maybe suggests it does. 
Sorry, um, just a small thing. There is a question whether it's possible to share the complete um, the notebooks that are finished. Um, you can find these in the same repository, but in the solutions folder. Um, so yeah. Okay. So there's a difference a little bit in the way we got, what we're going to train these models on and what we're going to test them on. We when we train them, because these are recommended system logs, we're going to train them on our Pi Zero, but our Pi Zero is probably pretty sophisticated. It probably does, it's not any of these simpler logs, or it's, it's more like uh, some of these more advanced log logistic regression models. It's doing something sophisticated. It's matching and, and delivering reasonably good, but not perfect recommendations to a user. So this thing is not at all uniform. If, if there's phones in someone's history, it's probably mostly recommending phones for example. Um, but when we go to evaluate it, as, as uh, Olivia mentioned, we're going to actually enumerate every single action in our set. Um, so we, for the most part, we can, we're going to assume stationarity, which is both shaky and not too terrible. So this P of X, this marginal distribution here, is going to be the same. But we're going to imagine that, that the logging policy is is focused around pretty good inter, um, recommendations. But as we evaluate it, we're going to simply enumerate across all. So this one has to be uniform. Um, so we're evaluating and training differently. Does this matter? And I guess the answer is a little bit, it depends. Uh, in order to show you why it might matter, I'm going to take you through a toy example here. And what we're going to imagine is that this blue line is some theoretical curve where we've got some similarity of the recommended item to the user's history. So at the right end, it means we're showing exactly the item that was in someone's history back to the user. And at the left end, it's somehow we're showing a completely unrelated item to the user uh, in their history. And what the curve's showing is that what you want to do is show a pretty related item, but maybe not exactly the same item in someone's history, which is like conceivably a reasonable thing. We don't necessarily want recommendation to be just repeating what's in someone's history. It needs to be a little bit different to this. Uh, so we can have a curve like this, and we're logging off a recommender system that isn't terrible, that's mostly delivering pretty good recommendations. And because it isn't terrible, you're seeing all of the value here at the right. So all of these points are going, uh, these green points are the, the logs, of, and only occasionally is there something where this maybe due to the randomization, we could be doing epsilon greedy or something like this. And we'll see a, a, a only very randomly these sort of lower score recommendations. Okay, so we've been running a recommended system. Let's fit the value-based model that we've been talking about. And what happens when, as we do this is, what, what we want to do is going to minimize, if we, okay, it's, it's a, it'll be a logistic regression, but we're going to minimize these distances here. So that means we're going to actually do the fit primarily on this piece on the right, because that's where all the data is. And we're going to fit a linear model because it's simpler, for example. Often the model we fit will be simpler. Obviously, this is a slightly cartoon example. Now, when we evaluate it, as we mentioned, we're going to evaluate this uniformly. So we're going to evaluate it across all of this space here. We can see, see that as we evaluate it uniformly, the error in these places are, is huge. Uh, and, and in fact, the line is going completely the wrong way. It's telling us that, that what we want to do is maximize the, or the difference between the history and the user, which is not quite the case. If there's if anything, we want to minimize it. Uh, so could we use something a bit like the IPS score, which will uh, use the fact that we're going to evaluate it uniformly, but our policy is in fact concentrated at this end to reweight these points. And when we do this, what we're going to do is really put very high weight on this point here, high weight here, and these points out here, much lower weight. And if we were to do this, we end up with something that looks like this, which is much more reasonable. And this is what we call the covariate shift problem with recommendation. It only occurs, so it's, this is a kind of a subtle and in some ways surprising thing. It only occurs if you're underfitting a model and using maximum likelihood. And usually you would actually do these same things. Usually when you're using maximum likelihood, you're restricting the capacity of the model so you do not, um, uh, so you do not have too much variance. And as a consequence, you will underfit a little bit. Um, 
So um, if you had a per perfect predictor, then perhaps you shouldn't make any care at all about if this changes. Uh, I, the issue is you probably will not have a perfect predictor, if, and especially not if you're using maximum likelihood. It really is going to force you down a Bayesian approach to do this. Um, so in these cases, if you're using uh, maximum likelihood, there is a potential problem by doing this due to this, this covariate shift. Um, yeah, so uh, this is really just, just restating this point. As, as we're you know, doing uh, value-based decisions, we're going to enumerate all actions or use our, one of our fast uh, algorithms for doing this. And so we need our model really to perform well everywhere. This is a, maybe a little bit of a complication in value-based models is if there is any action that you're estimating poorly, okay, both poorly and uh, the value of your poor estimate is high, it could well be higher than everything, even though you know very little about it. And that's not what you want. Uh, and so this is one of the major risks of um, using these value-based recommender systems trained off the banded feedback like this. And uh, it's, there's a second problem, which is quite related to this, known as the optimizer's curse. And we're going to see this in part two. Um, so we're, we're tidying a bit over time, but this is actually, in fact, really wrapping up um, uh, part one here. So we've seen that how the classical recommender system setting differs from real world and how uh, record gym uh, is, is, uh, can be used to build and evaluate recommendation agents and perhaps why it might be, despite the fact it's simulated better than using uh, standard test data sets. We've also started to look at value-based methods and we've highlighted some perhaps dangers or risks of using them. So I'm not going to tell you too much about part two because we're, it's about to start and uh, you're about to have a break, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Uh, we can start again. Um... And I don't know if people are going to uh, rejoin later. Um, so I, have, I hope everybody had, uh, had a nice break. I'm going to share my screen again. Can people um, uh, see my, my screen? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, so just uh, so just as a reminder, um, in the first part, uh, David and Olivier um, talked about the um, the uh, difference between what we call classic and modern recommendation. So basically, recommendation as autocomplete versus recommendation as actually an intervention policy. Um, talks a bit about uh, recommendation reward modeling. Uh, via uh, point estimate um, maximum likelihood models. And he started talking a bit about the, the shortcomings of these classical value-based value um, uh, methods. Um, now we're gonna, um, we're gonna start shifting towards uh, more of a policy learning uh, approach. We're gonna first introduce just some uh, concepts and notations, and we're gonna uh, start Fix, fixing afterwards all the issues that we saw uh, uh, previously. Um, and then we're gonna conclude. So without further ado, I think we can go. Uh, so like we said before, um, first part, likelihood-based models of bandit feedback. So basically predicting the reward that we're gonna get um, from a pair user state and recommendation. And from that, we built basically value um, value-based uh, 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 solutions uh, that just compute for each user the predicted reward for all potential recommendations, for all potential actions, and just take, take the one that basically maximizes uh, the reward. Um, and now we're gonna choose at a different way to choose actions, which is to directly learn the decision a function that maps the user state uh, to an action. So instead of modeling the reward first and then deriving uh, like a policy uh, indirectly from, from this value function, we're gonna learn a policy directly um, that maps user state to action. We call this, mop this mapping uh, a policy. 
And uh, the methods for optimizing it are going to be uh, called policy optimization or, or policy search methods. Just to drive home a bit more the, the, the analogy, uh, analogy, so uh, um, value-based models are like driving instructors. So every action of the student is evaluated. Policy-based models are actually more like driving a car. So you don't stop and evaluate each possible action. You just drive, you just put a higher mass on the action you're going to take. Um, so there are two uh, main approaches, at least uh, um, to, uh, from the ones that we're going to uh, talk about. So contextual bandits uh, are a class of policy models where the uh, state, for instance, in our case, the user state, is not dependent on pro uh, previous actions he, he uh, took, but only on his current context. Um, Again, context is, is, a vague, uh, is a vague term. It depends on how uh, we actually encode it. We're going to see afterwards examples. And actually, we did the examples in the case of, uh, of uh, likelihood um, uh, models. So we just um, model the user history in some sense. And the reward is only dependent on, on this and is immediate. Whereas in the reinforcement learning setting, which is more general and more complex, uh, the state definition takes into account previous actions. So an action, we get a reward from it, but it also transitions the user into a new state. And the reward is also delayed. It can be uh, like not immediate. So it's going to create um, additional credit assignment issues. Um, so this is just a picture to um, to uh, drive home the, the 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 difference. So in contextual bandit settings, we don't model these state transitions, whereas in uh, RL we do. Um, we're going to focus actually on contextual bandit setting for our case. It's a good ma match uh, for for the uh, for learning recommendation policies because in most cases, each recommendation has an independent effect conditioned on the user state. Again, it depends on how actually we model the user state. Uh, it simplifies a lot of things. And we do not have then to optimize for sequences of recommendations. Uh, again, we're, we're going to make the simplifying uh, uh, assumption uh, so that the user state can be then um, strictly modeled by the historical the organic activity. So just the actions. Um, uh, so just the action that the user took by himself, we're not going to take into account uh, the previous actions he took when we um, presented him with the recommendation. Um, so um, here, like one of the um, one of the uh, like some of the issues we we could have in deploying like reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, algorithms in real world ap application where exploration and learning uh, uh, is is actually costly, uh, like a, a case of an actual production recommendation uh, recommender system. We need to either build simulators, which is actually what happened with the with the Roku gym that you saw in the first part, or work on uh, Sephiroth. Uh, so again, this is just to uh, to um, to uh, to show you why we 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 will not cover uh, a reinforcement learning view of Roco right now. We're going to more um, focus on a contextual bandit view. Um, and to make things more concrete, we're going to start with some notation. Uh, so it's, it, it's going to be mostly similar to the notation you saw before, but there are going to be some changes. So I apologize for that if there is some, some inconsistencies with, the, with the, the notations in part one. So. Um, the variables x uh, denote arbitrary context. Again, context. We're going to use context, user state, state um, interchangeably. Uh, so these are arbitrary contexts drawn from an unknown uh, uh, distribution. Uh, y uh, denote the actions available or the actions uh, of, uh, of the decision maker. And the policy pi like previously, it's just a mapping, it's just um, uh, a mapping between uh, a context action pair, x, y, uh, and the probability distribution, uh, well, 
uh, pi is a mapping between the context and a probability distribution in the action state. So for a given uh, context action pair x, y, uh, the quantity pi, y, no, and x will just be the probability of actually taking the action y when presented with the context x. Again, uh, some additional notation, we're gonna uh, denote the uh, true action reward uh, or utility uh, of y in the context x by little delta x, y. The cost is just the opposite of that. Uh, and a policy risk, just the expectation the expected cost um, under uh, the distribution on the context and, and the action. And if we replace uh, this by the joint distribution over state or, or context action pairs, uh, we just get basically uh, this formulation of the true risk. Um, again, because we're working with finite samples most of the time, um, the empirical risk is just a, a, a finite sample approximation of the true risk. So it's just the empirical mean. Uh, and the empirical risk minimization uh, framework that uh, all of you know, uh, is just uh, actually finding the best parameters that uh, minimize this empirical risk. Uh, so in the real world, we always deal with finite samples. So there always exists a gap between our current estimates of the uh, risk of a policy and its true risk. So again, the true risk is the actual expectation. The predicted risk is the uh, uh, empirical mean over our uh, historical data point. In the case of a recommender system, for instance, a, a production recommendation system, like uh, we're on at Criteo, we can think of these, uh, these two quantities um, like this. The predicted risk is all these performance metrics that we collect from offline experiments uh, using these off policy estimators. We want to estimate if our system, if our future system is going to be good or not. The true risk is actually what's going to really happen in an online A-B test when we're going to deploy the system uh, using on policy measurements. So our new data set, uh, data points were going to be are going to be generated by the new policy. So uh, it's still coming from a finite sample, but we're gonna we're gonna consider it uh, that it's uh, of a much bigger size and lower var variance. So this is gonna constitute our um, true risk. So again, in our case, uh, the pre the predicted risk is what we thought is gonna happen, and the true risk is what actually happened. Um, and in order to evaluate the performance of our policies, um, there are two interesting quantities. The first one is the regret, which, was, which is a well-studied quantity. It's the difference uh, in true risk between the policy being evaluated and the actual true best policy. Again, it's, it's very, very hard to find the true best policy because we're minimizing just an empirical risk. So these two are very often different. And the regret is just the difference between, between the true risk of, the, of, uh, both, um, of both uh, policies. Um, and there is another maybe less talked about quantity uh, that is also interesting, which is disappointment or post-decision surprise. And this one is the difference between the true risk and the predicted risk of a certain policy, of the policy being evaluated. So as we pointed out before, it's the difference between the offline result and the online result. Um, using our new notation, so uh, David talks about um, one of the shortcomings of value-based methods, which is, uh, which is a covariate shift. Now we're gonna just talk briefly about um, a second one which is optimizers first, which tells us the dis disappointment of ERM-based decisions, the ones that we saw in part one, is always positive. Uh, so the, uh, it means that um, we are always, in some sense, overestimating uh, uh, how good uh, a, a policy based on ERM is. 
um, so again, if the if the uh, if the uh, real if the policy being like the best policy using ERM is different from the true best policy, this disappointment is strictly positive. Um, so this is just a sketch uh, of the proof. Um, you probably need to add some expectation there for, for, for it to make completely sense. Um, so a lot of the traditional theoretical work, uh, work in bandits and uh, reinforcement learning um, focus on actually uh, bound, uh, like getting good bounds and guarantees on regret. Uh, but more recently, researchers have started to look at bounding disappointment. Um, in our course, we're gonna we're gonna well in the rest of the course we're gonna show um, why this is important and how it can improve our overall uh, performance. Um, so now we're gonna start switching a bit from the value. So now uh, we presented the second shortcoming. Um, we talked a bit about disappointment. Uh, before I, I go on, are there any questions up until now? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, go on. Uh, feel free to ask your questions um, during the during the presentation. We, we will answer any questions you have. So now we're gonna start switching from these value-based methods to more of a policy-based approach. So again, uh, a reminder, the classical approach is just using empirical risk minimization to compute for instance, the probability of click for, for all the actions, and actually uh, um, uh, then as we're choosing the action that has the highest uh, probability of click, for instance, this is like a classical approach. Um, a more modern approach is to actually uh, model the recommendation as a stochastic policy that directly puts more probability on the actions that work well in the past. We're gonna define what that means uh, shortly, but it's just a switch from, again, a value a function to an actual policy function. Uh, so be, be, because value-based methods are just basically wrappers uh, around uh, like an ERM solution, we're gonna uh, call them uh, ERM decision methods and their best estimates are just uh, the, uh, theta hat ERM. Okay, why, 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 should, we, uh, why should we switch? Uh, so actually, it's not just because it's uh, it's cool or it um, looks better. It's going to actually fix um, or try to fix the two shortcomings we saw before: covariate shift and this uh, positive disappointment, this optimizer's curse issue. Um, and we're going to start seeing why. So the first uh, the first thing we're going to look at is actually fix, fixing uh, covariate shift using not empirical risk minimization, but something we will define, which is counterfactual risk minimization. So um, David presented the bit covariate shift, um, and previously he also presented briefly the uh, IPS trick, uh, but more for, from an evaluation perspective, uh, how to reweight historical observations to get an unbiased estimation um, estimate of the performance of a, of a, some policy, uh, we're going to use the same trick here and actually optimize on it. Um, so again, to fix covariate shift, we need to to have two distributions. Um, the 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 previous distribution is just the uh, distribution of data that we have logged. Uh, but what is the new target distribution we want to map our logged data into? In the case of a value-based uh, model, uh, before again, before moving on to a policy-based uh, solution, because at each each moment we want to take a decision, we actually predict for each possible action uh, what the reward will be, and then afterwards uh, getting an action from that. We need all our estimates in some sense to be good. We need to be uniformly good everywhere. So our new distribution uh, is actually uniform. Um, and to do that, in, I'd like to, to optimize for that, instead of optimizing, fitting the model on just the historical reward, we're gonna directly fit the model on these reweighted re rewards 
uh, by the ratio between the new uh, distribution, which is in our case in the value-based uh, uh, method, uh, just by uniform, um, over by zero. So the new distribution is uniform because we want to be uniformly, our predictions, we need them to be uniformly good everywhere. The previous distribution is pi zero, which served for actually logging our data uh, that we use for training. Um, but in the case of policy learning, um, the application of the IP trick is a bit more straightforward instead of doing this in direction we did for, for value-based uh, uh, models. Uh, we can actually, if you remember uh, this unbiased, we, we just need uh, to, to directly optimize uh, for the expected uh, cost under the new policy, which is this part. So we want directly to minimize the cost uh, under the new policy. And if we just, again, use the important sampling uh, uh, trick, this will give us, and again, because we only have data using pi zero, not pi theta, uh, we actually uh, reweight uh, reweight the quantity we want to take the expectation of by uh, the ratio between the new policy by theta and the pre uh, and the login policy by zero. Uh, and this will be called a counterfactual risk estimator. So right now we're not just using a normal like in some sense expectation like expectation of the just the cost. Now it's uh, the expectation of a reweighted cost. And the, uh, the empirical counterfactual risk estimator is again just a, a, a finite sample uh, approximation. Again, instead of, of uh, um, minimizing uh, just the uh, average, um, the average cost, now it's going to be the reweighted average uh, uh, cost reweighted by the ratio of uh, probabilities between the new policy pi theta and the previous login policy pi zero. Uh, so this is an unbiased estimator of the, the true risk of the policy. So this is what we wanted, that's very good. Uh, but if you look at this quantity here, it seems a bit weird and it can actually uh, give us some problems because this estimator has unbounded variance because this propen that we call propensity ratio uh, between the action and the login policy uh, can be can be can misbehave sometimes. We saw instances, for instance, if the new policy starts explore, exploring weird regions uh, that the login policy didn't even think of, we can start having problems. So um, the counterfactual risk minimization framework uh, is defined by this objective. So again, just instead of finding the best parameters that minimize the empirical risk, now we're gonna uh, try to find the best parameters that uh, minimize the counterfactual risk. We're gonna look uh, afterwards at some uh, example notebooks um, to see concretely what that means. Um, so we're gonna denote the set of contextual bandit methods that optimize for the uh, this counterfactual ob uh, objective as off policy uh, contextual bandit. So uh, off policy and counterfactual in, in, uh, in this context can be used uh, interchangeably. So like I said before, if the new policy by theta explores almost unknown regions of the previous policy, basically where pi zero, uh, the probability that the login policy uh, put on some action was very, very, very small and our new policy uh, puts maybe a reasonable probability on it, the weight will be very, very, very big. And this can lead to a very, uh, very noisy estimator, an estimator with very high variance. Um, so there are multiple ways to, to solve that. Uh, one simple uh, way that might, might even seem a bit simplistic, but it's actually used a lot in practice is just uh, clipping the weight, just replacing the uh, the um, the ratio, the IPS, uh, the the uh, ratio of propensity scores uh, by the minimum between some well-chosen constant m 
and the ratio. Uh, we won't have an unbiased estimator anymore, uh, but it's going to be one with lower variance. So again, like always, we'll have a, a biased uh, variance trade-off. Uh, the estimator has other problems that are detailed in the papers that we're going to put in the um, bibliography and even in the full slides that uh, David posted. Um, but we're going to limit ourselves just to this uh, problem for now. Um, so what, what happens um, for the case in, in the case of recommendation? How do we actually use this uh, in a recommendation setting? So it's actually very simple. Um, again, because we won't allow the agent to directly act according to the target policy without supervision, we will not allow like uh, policy improvements online or continuous improvement. We're going to learn the new policy, uh, like always, based on some logged data and release it uh, after an A-B test against the current policy. Um, it's just that the way we learn on this batch log data, it's going to be a bit, a bit different from uh, ERA, because now we have a new objective. OK. Um, now I'm going to move uh, to the notebook. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very similar to the likelihood, uh, well, quite similar to the likelihood notebook you saw before, uh, still in the Rocker Gym environment. Um, it's just that uh, now we're going to uh, be actually optimizing for the CRM objective instead of the ERM objective that just a simple logistic regression was doing. Um, and again, we're going to have a stochastic policy. Uh, so we're going to parameterize this policy by just um, like a soft max over uh, um, basically uh, over the, yeah, we're going to just get like a, a distribution on the actions. And we're gonna, uh, our policy is just gonna be sampling from the categorical distribution uh, induced by, by the probability of each action. Um, in our case, again, because our rewards are just click, no click, um, we're gonna be, we're gonna try to maximize the number of clicks we would get with the new policy by theta. So the new objective we're gonna try to maximize is just the uh, sum of reweighted clicks. And we're going to also see how we can clip uh, the weights and see if it gives us a better uh, estimate. Uh, so I'm going to now move to the notebook. I'm going to stop sharing the slides and then share the notebook. And boom, boom, boom. Can everybody uh, see my screen? Do you see the notebook? Yes. OK. Uh, cool. So um, like in the first part, um, we're going to start with logging some data, right? Uh, we're going to add some explorations, uh, some exploration, because this is necessary. Uh, to get like some actual apply zero, basically some probabilities on, on actions. Um, otherwise, it, we will just have like a deterministic login policy, which is going to be problematic. Uh, for the login policy, we're going to use, like before, just um, a popularity based uh, log. So we're going to assume that the previous system just showed um, uh, products. Uh, for instance, uh, proportionally to their popularity. Uh, I'm not going to run the notebook in the interest of time. Uh, I ran it already, so I got the results. But please feel free to run it cell by cell so we can understand what's happening. Just that it's going to take a bit of time. So I'm, um, I'm, uh, I pre-ran everything. So we generated some logs. And we're going to now, uh, just to get a baseline, uh, the performance, the CTR performance of a baseline, like previously, uh, we're going to consider an agent that is the same as the login agent, an agent that just um, shows products to the user uh, proportionally to the uh, to um, uh, to their popularity. So we get like a CTR estimate for this uh, this popularity agent, 
it's 1.3% uh, approximately. So this is our baseline. And we're going to try uh, to see if our new agent uh, based on, on contextual lenses uh, are behaving before we saw that the likelihood based agent did. And we're going to see if our contextual bandit agent uh, do as well. So it's the same feature engineering that was done uh, before. So I won't go uh, in detail through it. So again, just uh, having counters on like the, the user features are very simple. Just uh, how many times the user has saw each product historically. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I, I won't go into detail from that. And I'm going to go directly to the, the what we call the vanilla contextual bandit, which is the one that we saw, which is just um, um, basically in some sense like a, a, a multi-class a multi logistic regression model in some sense uh, that, is, that is just learned on the uh, CRM objective instead of like our normal maximum likelihood objective. So again, we're, we're trying to find theta star that is the, the that maximizes the sum of reweighted clicks. Um, I won't go into details into it. We're just gonna see that here. This is the part. So again, the rewards. So here you can. The rewards are a predicted probability, which is pi theta, over the probability of the logged action, which is pi zero. Here you don't see a C because in our case, um, a C is, is either one or zero because it's click, no click. And because we consider only the lines with clicks, so we just multiply it by one. So that's why here there's only the predicted probability. Again, and the predicted probability is just um, uh, basically we're, we're just um, putting a softmax on the, uh, uh, score of uh, the uh, the different action. Uh, we're going to look at then uh, then here we uh, here we can clamp uh, or or actually clip the the, the weights, which are in our case are the, uh, here the rewards uh, to some max weight. Again, we're going to add some bias just to um, make sure that this quantity does not explode. Uh, and the rest is the pretty normal. This is the most important part. Just how do we model our uh, loss function? The rest is just um, basically optimization. And if we run, uh, if we train uh, this, uh, this agent and compare it to the previous popularity-based agent, we can see that it's a bit better, which is what is expected. Um, so this is one without clipping. So just a contextual bandit agent without clipping. Uh, now we're going to take one where we actually uh, clip the weights to a quantity like 100 here. Then it needs to be well chosen. There are ways in the in the um, in the papers you will see different ways to actually choose this uh, this constant. We're going to train our uh, clamped contextual bandit agent. We're going to compare it to the two others. We're going to run like a simulated A-B test in Rotogym. And we see that it's actually much better than the two previous ones because of this, because it solves partially this variance issue. Any questions um, up until now? Uh, I really invite you to take a look at the, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to post I'm going to post the um, the notebook again. Uh, so please run to it and uh, take a look. Normally, everything is detailed. Um, don't hesitate if you have any question. I'm, I will just share my slides so I can uh, conclude on this part. So um, 
so CRM, the, 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 the whole thing, the, the reason we saw CRM and then the contextual bandit agent uh, is just to fix basically mostly the coverage shift issue. Um, can we do even better? Uh, yes. Um, and it's going to come by actually fixing the other issue, which is uh, optimizer's curse. And uh, that's, I will give, uh, then Flavian is going to take over this part. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop sharing so my screen. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah. Um, okay. Dun, 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 dun. Just a second. Okay. Preview. Um, share. Okay. Um, Oh, let's uh, get going. Um, so let me go to 3.2. Yeah, here. So this is my cube. So hi, everybody. Um, my name is Fabian. Um, thanks for uh, coming and staying with us till the end. Uh, so this will be the very last subsection of the course. Um, hopefully you you like it. It's probably something that not that many people talk about, but I think it's quite important to, uh, to be aware of this. Um, these ideas have been going on around policy optimization for a couple of years now, um, but it's more recently that uh, proper connections have been made with distribution robust optimization, and I think it's a, it's a good angle to, to understand what's happening in, uh, in policy learning and reinforcement learning. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about optimizing curse again a bit. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's see in the big picture, as, uh, as Amin was saying before, uh, we were having two problems with value-based models. Uh, first, we had the covariance shift. Um, so we moved this by moving, we solved this by moving to an IPS-based objective. Uh, and now we have uh, another problem. Uh, we have the optimizer curse, right? And um, that's what we want to do, it's to uh, fix it too. Um, but before even getting started to, on this, uh, th there is, a, there is a, another problem, which is, um, the fact that, uh, well, we had optimized discursive when value-based models, but uh, a lot of times we would kind of ignore it because it was not that important. Um, uh, but now, because we actually did the IPS, uh, the IPS reweighting, um, this, this problem is becoming a lot more important. So basically, uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, the moment we try to solve a uh, covariance shift, we need to start caring about optimized discurs because uh, the IPS term, what we'll do will actually increase the variance of um, of the arms that were not that often pulled in a, in kind of in a, the logging policy, basically in the existing policy from what we're learning, uh, and uh, it, they will accent it basically the the optimized curves, right? Those arms that are uh, very rare uh, have exactly uh, uh, the potential to. Uh, to become over uh, overestimated, and then basically uh, the the empirical estimator will will uh, make the biggest errors or exactly on these arms, right? So we cannot solve a uh, uh, covariance shift without solving optimizer's curse. Um, so uh, so how do we do it? So again, let's go back to the definition of optimizer's curse. Uh, we said that the the optimizer's curse it says that there is a high probability of uh, of being disappointed by your uh, offline estimator. That means that um, the, prob the, the reward that was predicted offline and the reward that we'll observe online once actually uh, we deploy the, the policy, the strategy uh, in, into the real world and observe the rewards or the risks, um, the complement of, uh, of uh, a reward, um, these this quantities will, will differ and we will tend usually to pick, because of the arc max that's happening in policy optimization, we tend to pick things that are overly optimistic, right? So we'll reverse back to the um, mean and the this, slides yes. are not really sharing properly, Flavian. Oh, right. Oh, um, yeah, they're not moving, actually, yeah. It's now oh, stuck on... Am, am I on page 35, or what do people see? Uh, slide number 12. Oh, I, I have no idea why. And there's nothing moving. Okay, now it is moving. Oh, okay, so uh, I'm sharing... Maybe let me share the whole screen, uh, because I'm sharing uh, only the... Um, the preview, and maybe there are two versions of this. Uh, okay, so let me... Uh, share again uh, the whole screen. Uh, just share, uh, share desktop. Then uh, I will go back. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, and thanks for telling me. Um, view the full screen. Okay, so this is 
doesn't lose so much because everything else was with our formulas. Uh, so we're saying that basically this is this is the problem, right? We're trying to get uh, a control over the optimized scripts, which is basically we want to bound the probability of having um, basically a, a policy that when rolled out, it's way worse than we expected, right? So we want to limit this probability uh, of having the discrepancy between offline and online uh, performance. And we want this probability of having still discrepancies to be bounded. So we're saying, okay, we're allowing uh, some discrepancies, but we want the probability of the discrepancy to be on the wrong side uh, to be bounded by a small quantity delta. So this is this is uh, basically uh, solving optimized scarcity. If we had this, we have a solution um, in place for policy learning that gives us this guarantee. We will we will call optimized scarcity solved. So we were looking for a method that does this, right? Um, and again, uh, again, the, the the reason we we have this problem is that when we empirical risk minimization, we only look at the uh, at the sample, sample average, right? We're looking at the expectation, but expectation is, is a statistic. It's not the whole story, right? Uh, and many times, basically, this statistic is not sufficient for decision-making, right? Uh, we, we look at the mean, but we don't look at the spread of the, of the reward or of the risk. Um, that exists, we just don't, we don't take it into account when we do uh, normal uh, decision, uh, basically decision, uh, uh, taking on on top of value-based models. So basically we just take our max without looking at the spread of that estimator. So one possibility, of course, uh, for the Bayesians out there is just to go fully Bayesian, so integrate over the whole distribution, not look only at the point estimate, uh, which doesn't tell the whole story, uh, doesn't summarize fully the, the, the distribution. Or um, the, the, there is another way, which is, let's say, not fully Bayesian, doesn't go all the way to, the, to look at the whole distribution, but still looks beyond just the empirical mean. Uh, and this is um, kind of uh, ideas from, these are ideas from um, uh, from uh, portfolio optimization, which are about like robust optimization and think about basically worst, uh, worst case scenarios, right? Uh, so we're looking directly, uh, in some sense, bounding disappointment is bounding the worst case scenario. So we'll look at ways to, uh, to guarantee that the worst case scenario is not at that, right? So we'll work, we'll work with these kind of ideas. Um, so the first quantity that uh, it's interesting in this kind of uh, framework, it's uh, the idea of uh, uh, robust risks. So we have, uh, for now, we have a risk, which is uh, this empirical risk based on our sample. Um, and um, this sample, you know, is just a sample, right? Especially at the beginning when this uh, sample size is small, uh, this, this sample uh, could lead us to very uh, wrong conclusions about the true distribution that generates the sample, right? So um, maybe it's a better, it's a good idea to actually um, to not fully uh, trust this sample and actually reason about a different quantity that maybe uh, will help us be take better decisions. So this quantity uh, called robust risk, it's uh, it's basically saying that instead of looking only at the at the sample at the data data points that we collected so far, we're looking at uh, a family of distributions that are uh, are fitting this the sample quite well uh, not necessarily just one the mo most likely right uh, usually we do maximum maximum likelihood so we just look at the uh, the distribution that basically fits the data much but we'll actually look at a bunch of distributions that fit the data well uh, and we'll think about the worst one so the one that could lead us uh, to the worst uh, to the worst loss if we if we don't look uh, if we don't prepare for it um, so to kind of visually uh, inspect what uh, happens is in on the left hand side, we have this uh, P, T, P uh, hat n, which is kind of the distribution the, that fits our sample the most. Basically, this is the one on which we will compute our um, our risk estimate and for which we will create the theta, right? We'll create the policy. So we'll try to minimize this, uh, this risk. And this is kind of the classical view. And now we'll replace this quantity with actually the worst case uh, in a family distribution skew. So, um, uh, all these kind of blue points are kind of distributions that are not too far away from the maximum likelihood distribution. Uh, and we will take out of all these distributions the one that extracts the biggest loss from us, right? So we have a loss, uh, we have a way to value any distribution. And we say that basically out of this family of distributions that fit well the data, um, Qmax is probably the, the most dangerous one for us. So we will actually uh, fit our policy for the worst case in this uh, in this distribution, right? And this distribution is usually defined by the 
by the distance epsilon. So that means that uh, we only look at distributions that are epsilon close to the best distribution that fits the data. So we won't uh, worry about distributions that are, are very unlikely to, to, to actually generate the data that we observe. Um, but we will still allow a bit of degree of freedom, so we won't look only at the max distribution because, of course, that uh, that's very likely not the true distribution as we will collect more data. Uh, any of these things are very likely to, right? Um, so now that we have this, um, okay, so one more thing. Uh, again, this, these distances uh, we, the, that we use to define the uncertainty balls, um, usually, um, Kind of the the favorite uh, class of uh, distances for this is uh, the class of F divergences, uh, and for those that are not familiar with that, are in some sense a generalization of the K divergence, right? So they are uh, some form of uh, functions that weight the odds uh, ratios between P and Q with different weighting functions. Uh, the most uh, kind of well known right now because of softmax and the cross entropy uh, minimization is K divergence, but there are others like reverse K divergence, chi squared distance, uh, and they're all uh, F divergences. Um, so this is what usually people uh, use to define the uncertainty ball. Um, and now going back to kind of our uh, risk minimization uh, objective, uh, we replace the ERM1 with, with, uh, with uh, the robust risk minimization one. Uh, so the overall um, problem is now a mean max problem, right? So we have uh, first a max over uh, the worst uh, case distribution, right? So we'll reason uh, with the worst Q possible in uncertainty ball that fits the data, the PN. And then on, on, on this uh, robust risk, we will uh, find uh, the policy that makes the robust risk uh, minimal, right? So we'll have a min-max problem. Um, so it's harder computationally, uh, but it gives us what we want, which is, uh, of course, the, the, bound, uh, the bound on disappointment. So now we have, uh, you know, uh, quite unsurprisingly, I would say we have we have the bound that we wanted. We solved the optimizer curse, which uh, basically says that now uh, the probability of being disappointed by the DRO uh, estimate uh, is quite small, right? Um, so this is, of course, if we think that in that uncertainty ball, um, the, the true distribution uh, is, uh, is, uh, bound, it's, uh, is captured inside the uncertainty ball. So if the true distribution of the reward is captured, uh, in that uncertainty ball, uh, reasoning about the worst case distribution in that uncertainty ball will give us a bound on, uh, on disappointment. So we want uh, we want to overestimate the value of our uh, policy uh, with respect to, to reality. With real, uh, so uh, to con uh, con to contrast this with the ERM, um, basically ERM has uh, basically asymptotic risk neutrality. That means basically um, ERM doesn't care if you underestimate or overestimate your value as long as in the long run, uh, you get closer and closer, right? So uh, basically, uh, the, um, the ERM doesn't, uh, doesn't penalize for, uh, for, uh, for being optimistic. Um, it, has, uh, it has no preference on which side you or your error is. Is it over, uh, over the uh, estimating or underestimating? But for decision making, because we do this RMX, we're actually more worried about overestimating because we want things that uh, that work as promised. Uh, okay, so another thing that's very nice about the arrow is that basically as, as we collect more and more data, uh, the things that we would like to have, basically the asymptotic uh, behavior is still there. So that means uh, in the limit, we have uh, you know the two uh, quantities that have been introduced, disappointment and regret. Uh, they are both basically uh, minimized. So basically, we will discover uh, the, the optimal policy as n goes to infinity if we, uh, we contain uh, the optimal policy in the family of functions that we are trying to fit. And again, of course, the disappointment uh, will go to zero uh, as you get closer and closer to the optimal policy. Um, so these are proofs that uh, have been uh, uh, appeared a couple of years ago in Ducci. So I encourage you to read it. It's at the end of the, of, uh, of the course. There are a couple of uh, references. Um, and um, yeah, so one thing that we need to understand is that all of these things are asymptotic, right? So um, we know that basically we'll get the same in the same place that the, the ERM uh, policy will get as n goes to infinity. But of course, uh, the DRO objective uh, will, uh, will be less, uh, basically, uh, it will be risk aversive. So you can imagine that in some sense, on the way, uh, the DR objective might take longer to discover the 
the true policy and will go to policies that are kind of playing it safe. Uh, so um, that means that you know there is no free lunch. Of course, uh, you know um, by having this additional constraint on risk averseness, it might take you longer to actually get to true policy, uh, but it might uh, you might be able to go through uh, through intermediate policies that are still. Uh, you know, better in terms of worst case, uh, worst case uh, um, performance, which for real, uh, real world systems is something that, of course, you care because um, it's important to stay in the game. So you cannot have, uh, for example, if you have a recommendation system that uh, in the first phase is it's, uh, it's horribly bad, uh, you might not have customers on which to, to evolve your recommendation system. So it's important that there is a minimum performance guarantee uh, over time, and uh, I think that's that's what we're realizing that this is an important guarantee to have. Okay, so now um, we we developed the arrow, which is this uh, uh, this way of bounding disappointment. So basically solving um, optimal curve. So now let's basically plug it in in the in our solution for the for the covariance shift, such that we uh, we get uh, the two things uh, together, right? So uh, with CRM, we uh, basically we reweighted uh, our sample. To, to move it into kind of the new distribution in the acting policy distribution. Uh, and now basically, uh, so this is the CRM loss uh, here, LCRM uh, in the bottom. Um, and now we will basically um, um, sample points from a joint distribution that is now coming from a queue that's the worst case uh, queue uh, from this uncertainty ball and then we'll minimize for that. Um, of course, this sounds very complex and uh, sounds very intractable, and in the general case, it is. So I want to, of course, say that uh, for you know, uh, if you put this uh, this data to be any form of uh, you know uh, policy, uh, uh, any form of uh, kind of neural that you want there, and of course, uh, again, the uncertainty ball can have uh, very weird definitions. Uh, so in the general case, uh, this is a very, very hard problem. This min-max problem, it's a very hard problem to optimize for. Um, so, 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 of course, uh, you know, uh, wanting to bound the optimizer's curse comes as, the, as at cost. But uh, there's some good news, and this is, uh, this is uh, where everything kind of, uh, you know, comes to fruition, is that um, in the case of coherent F divergences, which is a special class of F divergences, um, we can show that, uh, the robust risk optimizing for the robust risk it's not that far away from minimizing for empirical risk um, it's just uh, you need to add one more term which is uh, uh, a term that it's kind of a regularized term that uh, um, uh, represents the empirical risk variance uh, we'll show immediately what that means uh, so this is for all uh, coherent divergences in the in the limit the area asymptotic equivalent so there is a term that goes away and goes to infinity. In the case of the chi-squared uh, divergence, uh, that term actually is zero. So from, it's actually, uh, it's an exact solution for chi-squared, um, um, basically minimizing for empirical risk plus kind of empirical risk variance gives you a distribution robust uh, optimization solution uh, if the true uncertain set is defined by chi-squared divergence. Uh, I know it's a mouthful, but, um, it's an important concept, and uh, I encourage you to, to you know, come back and uh, and uh, read carefully, um, especially these two papers. Uh, basically, the, the first paper uh, came in 2015 and introduced poem uh, that is exactly a CRM for chi-square distances. Um, they introduced it with a different kind of justification, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it solves the narrow uh, CRM problem for the case where the uncertain set is defined by the chi-square distance. Uh, the you know small plug for for our work last year we we uh, we basically uh, published a paper that basically tells kind of this generalization uh, story for um, uh, for uh, for all coherent divergences um, in uh, in the case of counterfactual risk minimization and we develop also kind of a tractable algorithms for the special case where the policies exponential, basically softmax, then um, the divergence is scale. Um, and in that uh, very specific case, but which is quite, you know, uh, quite general, like, you know, people use this pair all the time. Uh, we, we have a very quite tractable algorithm that, uh, that shows 
uh, state of the art results and the bits poem, uh, um, basically uh, most of most of the tasks. Um, so now um, to go cl closer to our final exercise, I know we're running out of time a bit, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, this is the poem objective. So again, this is the risk of the contextual bandit, the R hat, and is uh, what we had in the vanilla contextual bandit. And now we have this additional term, which is the variance term, uh, which is the variance of this quantity. Basically, it's the variance of the IPS term. So what it means is that uh, this, uh, this objective will be minimized by uh, a policy, pi theta, uh, that is close to from pi zero, so that this IPS term doesn't explode, so this IPS doesn't uh, become big, so this new policy is not far. Um, so it means that uh, you, you can improve on the previous policy, but only by um, making uh, arms, uh, pulling arms more often, only in places where those arms are already pulled reasonably often. So you cannot create a policy that is super far from the old policy, just because uh, uh, that means that the uncertainty on, on the parts uh, that the new policy seeks to improve are, it's, it's just too high. So uh, we don't have sufficient information to, to go there and uh, to guarantee that we're not gonna overestimate the, the performance. Um, so um, this is the last exercise. I guess uh, one question for the participants. Uh, are you willing to take two or three minutes to, to go over the last exercise? Um, I'd like to, to know what you guys think. Is everybody okay with that? In the meantime, in the meantime I I'll stop maybe. sharing. Yeah, exactly, I'll stop sharing. And of course, let us know if you have any questions. Okay. Did you find it? Okay. I did post share. Is that sufficient? Yes. Can you share again or not? Or uh, uh, no, I, I cannot share. Stop no. share. No, okay. you need to stop, stop share. share. No. Okay. Done. Okay. Uh, so I'll just uh, so I'll just share the um, the last. It's in the same notebook as before. Uh, the same notebook with the contextual bandit setting. Uh, so you'll find the part like a new class, a new agent called poem. A contextual bandit, um, and the only thing that's going to change is the loss. Uh, whereas before, we optimized for this theorem objective, this uh, uh, reweighted, uh, re um, like the sum of reweighted rewards uh, kind of objective, uh, which is actually right here. If you remember, pi theta over uh, pi, uh, everybody can see, by the way, everybody can see the, the notebook, right? Uh, yes, yeah. I should have asked too. <laughs> yeah, uh, pi theta uh, over uh, pi zero. Um, we're gonna now add, instead of just taking the mean of this, we're gonna take actually the variance as well. Again, the variance of the quantity pi theta over pi zero, like the vector pi theta over pi zero times the reward. So to, in our case, it's just the variance of the loss. And now our overall loss is gonna be uh, not only uh, just this uh, reweighted uh, uh, reward term, but also this variance penalization term. As always, we're going to train uh, this. We're going to we're going to choose a reasonable variance uh, penalization factor. The way to choose it is obviously uh, like always valid like having a validation set or doing cross validation is just a hyperparameter. We're going to optimize. Uh, we're going to learn, and then we're going to, um, like always, test our agents against all the previous ones. So the first one was the organic popularity-based simple agent. Uh, then afterwards, it was the contextual bandit agent. And then the second one is contextual bandit with clipped IPS weights, and now the POEM agent. And we can see that it's significantly better than all the previous ones. So penalizing actually the variance it did help in getting a better agent so again it, it looks very complicated when you see uh, the, the formulas but it's just changing the loss and adding a term that depends on the uh, on the standard deviation of the um, of the weights uh, and i guess uh, that's good are there any questions about the exercise Again, I posted the notebook in the uh, channel. You can go through it at your own pace.
I guess there are no questions. Um, I guess we're done. Um, thank you guys for attending. Any last questions? Any, you know, comments? Uh, we, you know, we welcome the comments here or uh, via Slack or via email. We'd like to know what did you guys think if you liked it. Um, yeah. So hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed and uh, it made sense, most of it. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, you guys so have a... Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I well, just wanted to say again. Uh, so we posted the slides, the material, and everything. Um, normally, nothing is missing. Uh, we're going uh, we're gonna to normally um, have a recording if everything is well. Uh, so you can revisit it whenever you need it. So. Um, yeah, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the course. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. You guys take care. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.